Madam Chair, you have a live mic. Thank you. I'd like to call the April 28th meeting of the Basin Board to order. If you could please stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, everyone. I have a few uh, house housekeeping items uh, before we get started. As a reminder, today's proceedings are accessible via Zoom, as well as Call Your TV and the district's website. Board members, just a general reminder when speaking to please use the buttons on the dais to be recognized. And please check your microphone to make sure that everyone can hear you when you speak. And Mr. Hill, you're on uh, Zoom today. Please raise your hand feature. And for the public. <laughs> Are you there, Mr. Hill? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Okay. Um, for public comment, for those here in person, if you would like to comment on an item that's not on the agenda, we have two public comment periods, one at the beginning of the meeting and one at the end of the meeting. For those of you here in person who would like to comment on an agenda item, please complete a speaker form in the lobby and bring it up to Miss Erin Connor, who's sitting to my right. If you're joining by Zoom, please use the raise the hand feature and staff will call on you. And if you're participating via phone, star nine raises your hand and star six mutes and unmutes your phone. Before we get started on our full agenda today, I wanted to take a moment to note that this past weekend we celebrated Earth Day. And there were several events in town to, to celebrate the occasion. Here on the Paradise Coast, we're really, really lucky to have such a beautiful natural environment. It's incredible to live here. And I hope its year-long beauty reminds us as a way to celebrate how much our beautiful environment contributes to our way of life. With that, Ms. Keeler, do we have any agenda revisions? No, Madam Chair, there are no revisions. Okay, thank you. Abstentions by board members from items on the agenda. Uh, I'm gonna ask each board member if they have any ab abstentions or disclosures on the agenda. Vice Chair Waters? Uh, none for me. Okay, uh, Ms. Ms. Rivera? None for me either, please. Okay, Mr. Hill? Mr. Hill, do you have any abstentions or disclosures on the agenda? Okay, we'll get back to him. Uh, I do not have any. I can hear some rustling, but I do, I do not hear him. Okay, we'll move on Try to- again. I, don't, I don't have any. Okay, thank you, Andy, okay. I appreciate that. Okay, so there are no, so that was, none of the board members have any abstentions or disclosures. Okay, approval of the minutes for the February 24th Big Cypress Basin Board meeting. I'll need a motion and a second to approve, approve the minutes, please. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve, ma'am. Okay, Vice Chair Waters uh, moves to approve. Can I have a second, please? I'll second. Ms. Rivera a seconds. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and vote. Vice Chair Waters? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Ms. Rivera? Yes. And I vote yes, so that's a, a, an anonymous, uh, excuse me, unanimous uh, vote. All right, we're moving to public comment. This is the first of two public comment periods for general public comment. Uh, there are two opportunities, and this public comment period is for items that are not on the agenda. Erin, is there any public comment? Yes, Madam Chair, in the room I have Angel Rodner. Hi, everybody. I'm Angel, and this is Hannes. And we are here um, in sort of an unusual- excuse, excuse me, could you bring the microphone down? Yes, and talk right into it, yes. We're here in a delightful, heartfelt moment to say thank you in person, starting with Charlotte as chair of the board, and Lisa Keller, 
And I'm going to read a letter which will just explain what we feel because you can hear my voice sort of shaking. We are thankful from the bottom of our hearts, don't know how to say more. So the subject of the letter is bank stabilization along the FACA Union Canal at 3850 37th Avenue Northeast in Naples. And the letter is addressed to Charlotte. Forgive me for saying dear Charlotte, but since you came to see us on the property, we feel like we have a personal connection. We want to express deepest gratitude for solving the huge erosion problem along the east side of our property. Our special appreciation goes to you and your team for a job exceedingly well done. Here's the history. 2010, we purchased the property at the subject address. 2012, we realized that there was bank erosion and we started to make a record of its progress. 2016, we realized that the continuous erosion would endanger our house and our septic field. We made first contact with the South Florida Water Management District about our concern. And this led to a visit by Mr. Joel Arietta, who was then Bureau Chief Field Operations for Southwest Florida Water Management District. And he came out with two of his engineers. After the visit, Mr. Arietta's response to us was that the water flow was not impacted and no further action from the team was needed. Oh, we have a gap. Something's wrong. All right, so 2020, I'm so sorry, I will get you the corrected letter. We contacted Lisa by meeting her at a board of commissioners meeting. We were there for another reason, but we found out what her role was and we went up and we explained our tragic situation. And she suggested that we submit documentation to her office so they could look into it. And we did. So now we're back officially to the letter, which says our presentation plus various site visits by her organization's engineers led to the conclusion that our house and septic field were truly in danger from erosion. With Lisa's active support, the restoration project was approved by the board. And that's where we say thank you, thank you, thank you. 2022, March 8th, work started on the bank stabilization project when Paul Classe and members of his crew, Mako Touche and Dre Touche, arrived with their heavy equipment. Go forward, not very long. April 27th, all aspects of bank stabilization project, including site cleanup, were completed. And just a note, by April 26th, everything but site cleanup was done. That was his birthday. Oh. Hannes considers this a gift from God through the board. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We cannot thank you and Lisa enough for supporting this project. Lisa understood the situation from the beginning and was our greatest champion. Special mention all goes to Paul Classe and his amazing team, especially Mako Touche, Dre Touche, and Mike Barber. Not only was the bank stabilization project completed efficiently and quickly, it was executed to the highest possible professional standards. Side note, he's an architect builder. He knows these things. It was real. It was a tremendous joy for us to watch their almost miraculous transformation of a crumbling canal bank into an exquisitely built structure, which will surely last for many decades and preserve our home and septic bank field. With endless gratitude, Angel and Hannes. We mean it. And if you flip to the last page, there's a before and after picture. So you can just see what it looked like before and what it looks like now. And I know that Andy came by and did an after drone pick video. So you should have an after to go along with your before at some point in the near future. Thank That's all we got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to say how impressed and, and touched I am that you would take time out of your busy schedule to come here and say thank you to the board. And thank you to Lisa and her crew and Andrew Wolf and his field station crew. Uh, I can't tell you how often uh, agencies assist citizens and how, how few the opportunities are when citizens come and say thank you in a public forum like this. And this will go a long way for me. And it was just about doing the right thing. And when I visited you out there on the site, I said, you know, it would be how I would want to be treated. And, and, so, 
and the staff has the know-how and the professionalism to get it done, but also we have to protect our canals and make sure that they're in the best working condition so that they can convey that excess water to keep properties from flooding. So it was also for the canal's health and our flood protection as well. Thank you again all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the letter. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna give you the corrected one with all the people. I had 2020 on my letter. <laughs> Thank you so much. And that concludes public comment, Madam Chair. Okay, great. So the, uh, we'll move on then to our first uh, presentation, which will be by Joanna Weaver on the Western Everglades Restoration Project. And Joanna is going to give us an introduction today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you all for having me. Um, my name is Joanna Weaver. I'm the project manager for Western Everglades Restoration Project. Um, today, I'm here to give you an introduction to the project. It's a very large, complex project, so this is kind of a, an intro or um, brief overview. So the Western Everglades Restoration Project is part of the comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Excuse me, before you go on, I do not have the slides on my, my screen here. Okay, keep going. Okay, so it's part of the comprehensive um, Everglades Restoration Plan, or SERP. Um, and for those of you who are not that familiar with SERP, um, SERP is the single largest restoration program in the South Florida ecosystem. It's, uh, it was authorized in the Water Resources Development Act of 2000 and is a uh, federal state partnership that is um, to restore, protect, and preserve the water resources in our region. So it's a 50-50 cost share between um, the federal and state partners, the federal partner is the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Water Management District is the local sponsor, the state partner. So SERP has many um, parts and steps along the way. And um, in SERP, the, really the first phase is the planning project. So Western Everglades Restoration Project or WERP as we call it, because it's a lot to say, is still in the planning phase. So this project has uh, not yet been authorized. It's still kind of in that conceptual uh, blueprint phase. Um, the project, as you can see in the map here, is located, I don't know if you can, you can see my cursor, okay, is located in the, on the western side of the central Everglades. So Naples, you can see, is kind of over here um, to the west, and that little blue arrow is roughly about where Picayune Strand is, so that kind of gives you um, an idea of what we're talking about. It's on the eastern side of Collier County, so a big part of the project is in Collier County, okay? It, the intention <clears throat> of the project is to restore the flows on the western side of the Everglades, um, including uh, the Big Cypress Preserve, um, it will help with flows in Everglades National Park and with the Seminole Tribe and the Miccosukee Tribe area. So why are we doing WERP? Why, um, do, we need to, why do we need to restore the Western Everglades? So several years ago, um, most of you know that the Central and Southern Florida Project um, installed several canals and levees in the area. So you can see these, um, the L-28 Interceptor, the L-28, and the L-28 South. All those canals and levees restrict um, flow, that natural western flow of the Everglades. So it led to over drainage in some areas. It led to um, too much water in other areas. It, um, there's increased nutrients in some areas which cause like at the, the bottom of this triangle that we call it, there's a large area of too much water that's also nutrient laden water that you know, changes the, veget the natural vegetation in that area. So there's a large area of cattail growth. So those are some examples of why we're doing this project. Um, there are four main areas in WERP that the team is planning to put um, project components. So the 
topmost area where you see this um, diagonal arrow, we call that the West Feeder Canal Basin. So in that basin, the plan is to put a stormwater treatment area, and I'll get into that a little bit more later, but um, that will help with the water quality. The horizontal arrow is the North Feeder Canal Basin. There will also be a stormwater treatment area there as well. Um, the next area of components are the L28 interceptor in this circle. There will be um, a weir installed. Um, some of it will be backfilled and the levee uh, associated with that canal and parts will be degraded. The same with the triangle area here where you have the L28 interceptor and the L28. It looks like they meet, but they don't actually meet. There's some water that's discharged in that area. Um, and those large, the large uh, nutrient discharge has led to that cattail overgrowth, like I said. Um, so some of the, this, um, most of these canals south of I-75, which you see here, um, most of those canals south of I-75 will be backfilled and the associated levees degraded. Then we also have some work being done down here. We call the L-28 um, south. Uh, we have the L-28 tieback. Parts of this, the tieback here will be filled in the levee degraded. And then some parts, uh, not all of it, but some of most of the L-28 south will be uh, backfilled and the levees degraded. Then also some conveyance structures will be put underneath um, this canal to allow water to flow from water conservation area three, just to restore that western, westerly flow down there. Just to kind of orient yourself, um, because I know it's hard, th this project is so massive. It's um, roughly 1200 square miles, about the size of Rhode Island. Um, so it's very large. Um, you can see Lake Okeechobee is up here in the top right corner. Uh, I-75 is about through the middle of the map and then US-41 is way down towards the bottom. So um, this area here is the Miccosukee Reservation and Collier County, the Collier County line goes down like the um, Western side of the Miccosukee Reservation, just so you get an idea. So a good portion of this is located within um, Collier County. So the Central and Southern Florida uh, projects with the canals and the levees created um, some challenges in this area, which kind of led to the objectives that uh, the team came up with for the project. So some of those challenges were the divided habitat, you know, the canals cutting off flow in areas, um, the changing the natural flow, the loss of uh, native um, plants and animals, um, increased wildfires, <clears throat> some areas were drier than they should be, um, poor water quality. So these, all these um, challenges affected Big Cypress Preserve and also had an impact on um, traditional tribal practices, which is also very important. So the objectives that the team came up with are to restore these flows, which um, will imp improve the hydro periods, um, sheet flow, restore some of the natural fire regime, uh, reestablish that connectivity with the other natural areas um, that are around the Western Everglades and the Big Cypress Preserve. And of course, um, improve the water quality conditions in the area. So how are we going to meet these objectives? Uh, like I said, this project is still in the planning phase. So in the SERP world, we come up with what we call a tentatively selected plan. So the tentatively selected, selected plan is kind of a blueprint for the project, a blueprint for how are we gonna do this, okay? So, we still have not, we still don't have a, an approved tentatively selected plan that should happen this summer. Um, so this is our proposed tentatively selected plan <laughs> or proposed TSP. And we call that alternative HR and that stands for hybrid revised. 
So it's a hybrid plan. Um, originally, the team came up with about five different alternatives. And from those five different alternatives, um, they kind of chose components of each one and came up with this hybrid plan. Well, modeling was done uh, about, I think about a year ago. And with that new modeling, they kind of tweaked the hybrid plan. So that's how we get to hybrid revised. So just so you know, that's what alternative HR stands for. It's hybrid revised. It's a hybrid plan that's been revised due to modeling. I won't go over every single component of alternative HR because that could take a long time. It's, it's like I said, it's a very large, very complex project. So I'm just gonna go through a, a few of uh, the main portions of the project. The first one, you can see these little yellow areas on the north side of the project, just to the west of the Seminole Reservation and just to the north. So those are what we call stormwater treatment areas. Um, Stormwater treatment areas are constructed treatment wetlands that will improve uh, water quality. So there's approximately, um, I think it's over, just over 7,000 acres of STAs or stormwater treatment areas. So the water will flow into those areas from the west feeder basin and the north feeder basin. They'll have um, a certain, you know, stay in there a certain amount of time, the nutrients will be taken up. Uh, by the vegetation, and then the the uh, Wingate Mill STA stormwater treatment area here will flow south through this into this natural slough, and then that water will continue to flow south into Big Cypress Preserve. Uh, the North Feeder STA, the water will flow into that from the Western Basin and flow in be discharged into the L3, and then be discharged south. Um, down into, and it will eventually flow into water conservation area three. So those are the two main components for water quality. Then um, the canals, uh, the L28I interceptor and the L28, parts of it, you can see this area that's kind of blue and red. Those will be um, backfilled. The canals will be backfilled and the levees associated with them will be degraded. Um, there will be multiple control structures. You can see some of them, there's some weirs, and then these control, control structures down here on the L28 South. Um, and there will be some tree island restoration. So the tree island restoration, when these canals were built, some of them went through right through the middle of tree islands. So after the canals are filled and the levees degraded, they're going, we're going to restore those tree island up to natural, natural grade. So the district um, thought about, you know, what we could do, what the team could do to expedite some of these project features. So these features are still a part of WERP. They're still um, cost shareable, um, but we wanted to come up with, to think of something that we could do to get the project moving forward until it's authorized. Um, so these, the team came up with um, the idea that we could uh, go ahead and um, design, do the design for the uh, water control structures that go under L28 South. So this is the area down near US 41. Um, the, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with the jet port here. And keep in mind that um, the Eastern boundary of Collier County goes about to the hits at about the end of that jet port um, road there. Okay, just to give you an idea of where we are on US 41. So the team just recently started um, the design or initiating the design work for these water control structures um, to give us some early benefits um, to water conservation area three. So some of that water can flow um, to the west or to the east if needed, depending. Um, and we're also uh, continu we're continu continuing some modeling, evaluating um, if we need any additional downstream conveyance under US 41, um, 11 mile road here, and also a loop road. So finally, um, the schedule, where are we? We're, um, like I said, we're still working on the tentatively selected plan and 
at the time that this um, these slides were written, it was we were hoping for August of 2022, but we're trying to move that up a month to do actually do it earlier than we originally stated, which is good. And then once we get that tentatively selected plan or blueprint or you know conceptual plan for the project, then we can move on to the project implementation report. And the project implementation report includes um, the environmental impact statement and the, the NEPA coverage. It's a it's a tight schedule, but um, you know we're pushing through it, and we're definitely you know have a have a good path moving forward. And there are some uh, a few policy issues that we're working on for the project implementation report, including um, the real estate in the area. There's um, a lot of in in holdings in Big Cypress Preserve, and um, north of <clears throat> I-75. Also water quality. So those are the couple of the policy issues that we're currently dealing with. Um, but we're confident that we can get the, the final chief's report um, in December of 2023. So the final chief's report is what is transmitted to Congress for authorization. So once that goes to Congress for authorization, um, we're hoping it's included in the um, WERDA 2024, the Water Resources Development Act of 2024. And that's any questions? Okay, thank you, Joanna. And we'll go ahead with board comment. Are there any board members that have questions or comments for Joanna? Yes, Ms. Rivera. <clears throat> Joanna, um, on the slide where you had the yellow STAs indicated, um, those STAs are not in place right now. That's no, part no, of this project. Yeah. Okay. So do, do we have... Um, do we know what type of uh, water quality conditions we're going to specifically we're going to be trying to address and and hope to improve? Uh, yes, they, okay. there's um, communities to the north and some agriculture in the area. So is it primarily nutrients or are there other other contaminants? Okay. Nutrients, yes. And and do you have a target or do you know what? what specific type of wildlife is going to benefit the most from this um, project in in this western Everglade area or uh, I think mostly the birds you know wading birds and uh -huh. um, panthers I yeah I, I would think the panthers so do we test the water obviously before it goes into the STA after it leaves the STA, and then are we going to test it uh, after the sheet flow before it gets to the canal on 41? There are water quality monitoring stations all through that area. I can't, I don't know offhand where exactly they are, but it is part of yeah. the project and there are some existing already in the area. So, so the intent is to make sure that, that it's uh, meeting its targets before it gets integrated with with Preserve. with the uh, with the other water that's on that canal along 41 so we know whether we're hitting our our mark or not okay thank you okay vice chair waters um one thank you for the presentation that was very good um the just i don't have a great familiarity with the, the federal processes so when you get to to the word uh, that basically is congress saying we I guess we approve the chief's report. This is a real project. Does that mean it goes at that point or then does money have to get appropriated for it, for it to actually get started and to happen? Money has to be appropriated. Okay. So yeah, the 2024 in a word, it would not be the end of it. It would be, then you got to get the money. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, Joanna, a number of, of questions and thank you for this. Um, this excellent presentation. My my first words. I think I have a conflict of interest with this, since this is an area that will um, the downstream uh, flows will impact the area that I've been fishing for about 25 years, and uh, I can share a few things to value. I believe for this um, uh, presentation today. Uh, what I have experienced is a significant reduction in freshwater flows 
And that's been, I believe, and I'm not a scientist, I leave that up to you and others, the, um, the uh, salt um, marsh grasses along the western Everglades, uh, the perimeter of the estuary has, is basically void of salt marsh grasses and also turtle grasses further offshore that once predominated that whole area, now are gone. And speaking with people in the um, Everglades City and Chukaloski community that have lived there for many decades, they indicate the lack of, of water flows that once was there as a possible uh, issue. I did have a technical question, though. Uh, I see a number of little uh, circles um, adjacent to Highway 41. I'm assuming those are uh, ducts for allowing for water flow underneath the road? Uh, yes, those are existing culverts. The Good. little black and circles. I just, um, is, yep, yep. Okay, just wanted to make sure that was a concern that I, I had that existing water flows are being obstructed. Now, does anybody ever check to see if those are actually functioning? Um, yes, some of those okay. are, I believe, are DOT culverts. So they, mm -hmm. they definitely maintain the culverts and check on them. If there are culverts, we also go out and maintain those culverts. Yeah. So uh, the only thing I can add, if anybody uh, or any of the constituents um, would like a closer view of this area and what the effect could be in the estuary, I'd be glad to take somebody for a boat ride through the areas that are going to be directly benefiting from this project if, if it ever gets approved and uh, put into uh, uh, place. So good luck. I'm there to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And there's there's several stakeholders in the audience today here. So uh, I'm sure that they heard about that trip on your boat and they may take you up on it. Unfortunately, I can't, I can't because of the sunshine laws. But other than that, uh, some of the stakeholders may take you up on that. Uh, one, one term that you use, Joanna, uh, you just threw it out there because I know how familiar you are with it, but maybe some of our, our uh, audience may not be. You use the term cost shareable. Can you please explain that in regards to funding? Sure. Um, the CERT projects or the Comprehensive Everglades uh, Restoration Plan um, are, we call it cost shareable. So it's a partnership with the federal government where there's a 50-50 cost share of these projects. So the federal side is responsible for basically 50% of the work and we're, and the state is responsible for 50% of the work. And the agency that does the work on the federal side is the Ar US Army Corps of Engineers and uh, the South Florida Water Management District is considered the local sponsor or the state side of that work. And Joanna and I were just out in the Big Cypress on Tuesday. I wanna thank Mike Elfenbein for arranging a, a group to go out there. There were several stakeholders, members of the US Army Corps of Engineers, the Gladesmen. All of us were out in the Big Cypress looking at several of the current conditions of work. And we were out there also with the tribe on the tribe lands. And uh, to think that that was just a small piece of it is just incredible how large the, this project is in our back backyard. So uh, it was good to have your introduction today as well. We'll go to public comment now, Erin. Erin, is there any public comment on this? I have no public comment, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. Move on to the next item. All right, the five-year update to the Lower West Coast Water Supply Plan, very another important topic to our coast. We've got uh, Tom Colios, who's going to kick it off and then we'll be followed by Bob. Good afternoon, thank you for having me here. Um, as Chairman uh, Roman has stated, uh, my name is Tom Colios. I'm the Water Supply Planning Section Lead at the district. I'll be giving you some background information about water supply plans, and then I'll turn it over to Bob Verastro, our Lower West Coast Plan Manager, and so he can give you some details about the overall plan update, as well as specific information about Collier County. Uh, this presentation is really for informational purposes and no actions required by the Big Cypress Basin Board. We will bring this plan update to the district governing board in November for their consideration of approval and Bob will share a, a timeline with you in his presentation. 
Um, we don't start from scratch on these plan updates. Instead, we build on the work that has been done previously. Every five years, we have, we're required to update a water supply plan. Um, they were initiated in the 1990s and regular updates have been made uh, to these plans ever since. Florida statutes requires water management districts to identify sufficient supply sources and future projects to meet the existing reasonable beneficial uses during a one in 10 year drought uh, for a minimum of 20 years while sustaining the water resources and the natural systems. Um, legislation was passed in the late 1990s requiring water supply plans to have these elements listed here um, demand estimates and projections must be for at least a 20 year period. Um, sources must be identified um, and resource analyses conducted. Um, as you can see on the map, um, the district's been divided into five planning areas, um, basically around drainage basins. And the development of plans for every region is staggered since we have the same planning team working on each one. Uh, the dates on the map represent when the next update is due uh, for that region. And as you can see um, in the Upper East Coast in the right, upper right um, was completed last year, Lower West Coast this year, and after that, Lower East Coast. Um, you might also notice that Lake Okeechobee touches four of our planning areas. However, Lake Okeechobee is formally included and addressed in the Lower East Coast water supply plan. Um, and I, as I said, that's next year, we'll, we'll do that update. Um, the planning horizon for this uh, lower West Coast plan update is from 2020 to 2045. So it's actually a 25 year uh, period. Just to tell you a little bit about what regional water supply plans do and what they don't do. Um, simply speaking, a water supply plan is a proactive approach towards water supply. We know there'll be increased needs for water in the future and potentially some shortfalls. So water supply plans provide a roadmap to let us get ahead of those demands by identifying sources and strategies now on how those demands will be met. Although the plan does not establish minimum flows and minimum water levels or MFLs, those are adopted by rule. Um, however, the MFL prevention and recovery strategies are included in the water supply plans. And approval of the plan triggers a requirement for local governments to update their 10 year water facilities work plan within 18 months of plan approval. Public participation is critical to our process. Um, we look for multiple opportunities to solicit input. Um, as indicated here, we use a a variety of forums to solicit input, um, governing board meetings, stakeholder meetings. We had our first stakeholder meeting um, last month in March, March 15th, and we plan on having our second one next month um, in the end of May. So the 2017 plan that was done five years ago identified issues um, regional surface water and shallow freshwater sources are insufficient to meet growing needs over the next 20 years. So alternative water supply sources must be developed and expanded to make up those shortfalls, including brackish water from the Florida aquifer system. The long-term sustainability of brackish water sources was analyzed with regional groundwater modeling, which was presented in 2020 and will be presented again next month at our second stakeholder meeting. Um, but the plan did conclude that future demands can be met through 2040 with the appropriate management, conservation and implementations of projects in, that, in the plan. And that's all I had for my overview. Um, I can take questions or turn it over to Bob for some more detailed information. Let, let's go ahead and move on with Bob's presentation, okay. and then we'll go from there. Okay. Thank you. Bob Barastro, good to see you today. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Gosh, I'm looking awful gray in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, yeah, a water supply plan. It is, it's essentially a forecasting process where we, we look ahead 20 years uh, into the future and we update that 20 year forecast every five years. So for the Lower West Coast plan, uh, we've got a planning horizon. Our base year is 2020. And what we're looking ahead to is what are things gonna be like at 2045? Uh, and we get a lot of information from the state and various uh, departments uh, from the Bieber, the, the Florida Bureau of Economic and Business Research. In this lower West Coast planning area, we're seeing that the population by 2045 is going to increase by about 36%, roughly 400, a little bit more than 400,000 more people. Uh, are going to be moving into uh, Lee County, Collier County, a little bit of Glades, Henry, and Monroe County. Um, over that same time period, agriculture from the Department of Agriculture, uh, the actual acreage of agriculture is going to move along very, very slowly. There's going to be a very minimal increase of about 5% uh, over that same time period of agricultural acreage. And when we sum up all of the water demands that were supplied in 2020, and we compare them to what th those supply needs are going to be in 2045, uh, it's roughly uh, about 130 million gallons a day more of water, about a 14% overall increase uh, in water demand uh, by 2045. So, when we do a water supply plan, there are actually five categories of water supply that we look at as defined by the, by the state. Uh, this table shows you the public water supply category. Uh, and those are folks, that's the population that lives within service areas of water utilities that are being provided by a public utility. Domestic self-supply are folks that are off the grid. They're folks that have homes that self-supply. They've got a well or a couple wells probably uh, that are not provided water by a utility itself. Uh, agriculture is, is actually, agriculture, just so you know, is, is the big, kah big kahuna in the Lower West Coast area. Uh, in terms of water use, uh, agriculture by far uh, the quantity of water that is used by agriculture uh, is, is the dominant water user in, in the Lower West Coast area. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other smaller categories, commercial, industrial, and institutional. Uh, those are all the businesses that uh, might be in this area. Landscape and recreation are golf courses, parks, mostly tied with, cl most closely with how population is going to increase is where recreation and landscape irrigation comes from. And then power generation uh, are, are uh, of course, FPNL and the other providers in this area. So when you sum up all those categories and you, and you look the difference between 2020 and 2045, it's roughly about 130 million gallons a day more water is going to be needed when you sum up all of those categories. So talking about people, uh, I thought I'd show you this slide here, uh, the difference in an aerial shot of Naples in 1940 as opposed to 2021. Uh, you can see that the landscape has changed quite considerably. Uh, a lot of people have moved into this area. And uh, of course, our projections are showing that uh, a bunch of people are going to continue to move into this area. And I thought I would zoom in to Collier County uh, just to show you a little bit about of the specifics, the, the stats on Collier County. Uh, right now in 2020, uh, comparing to 2045, Pretty much following along what the what the Lower West Coast Bieber is showing us, there's going to be a about a 34 percent increase in population, uh, maybe more than a, a couple hundred thousand people more. Irrigated acreage actually is going to decline in Collier County. Uh, there's going to be a slight decrease in the quantity of water that agriculture is going to need as a result of a, a diminishment of acreage, uh, at least in Collier County. Uh, and gross water demands are essentially going to increase by um, roughly 17 million gallons a day overall in out of all of the categories uh, in Collier County. So where's that water going to come from? 
Uh, what, are, what are the choices that we have? What are the alternatives that we can get that water from? And of course, these are, these are water source options. And uh, there's many on this slide, reclaimed water, surface water reservoirs, surface water canals, seawater, uh, saline groundwater, fresh groundwater, aquifer storage and recovery, uh, and water conservation. So when we do the plan, uh, we're kind of looking at all of these options as to how those demands will be met in the future. And we look at all this variety as part of our analysis of the plan itself. Of course, the, the smartest water that you can use is the water that you don't need. And that is where water conservation uh, comes into play. And uh, here in the lower West Coast area, um, the per capita usage, the graphic that you're looking at is actually the quantity of water that each person uses daily. And we look back at those numbers in the lower West Coast area in the public water supply arena. Back in 2000, people were almost using 180 gallons per day per person. Uh, and over that same, over this time period in the last 20 years, people really have gotten a lot smarter about water conservation. Um, there's a lot, there are irrigation ordinances now, a lot of the public water supply, uh, people have gotten smarter about, about using the potable water that they have, uh, and about the expansion of reclaimed water, substituting reclaimed water for irrigation rather than, uh, rather than potable water. So uh, I think, I think it's something of a success story right now. The, the per capita rate is about 120 million, uh, 120 gallons per day per person. We'd like to see it go lower. Um, in fact, we're, we're, we're aggressively trying to institute uh, additional water conservation education measures uh, to try to get uh, more folks to even be smarter about water because we think that water can get what that per capita number can get lower. So another place, one of the first places that we can actually look to get water from in the area in the future uh, our groundwater sources. So I thought I'd I thought I'd show you. I'm a hydrogeologist, so I always have to have a cross section on one of my presentations here. These these are all the aquifers that are available in the Lower West Coast area, and and it actually is a very simplified version. But you know, from ground surface, uh, there's the water table aquifer that might extend 50 to 100 feet below land surface. Then there's the Lower Tamiami aquifer maybe down to 100, 150 feet. Then below that is the sandstone aquifer. Uh, those are the blue formations on the graphic to the left. Uh, and then a little bit deeper, almost down to 800 feet or so is the mid Hawthorne aquifer. Uh, and then down there at 1000 feet is the Floridan aquifer. And I put some dots on the cross section to designate what e each aquifer is. And what I've done is we've translated those same colors to the map on the right. And so in this lower West Coast area, you can actually see where the aquifers are productive and where they're not. Um, the aquifers in this lower West Coast area are actually somewhat stingy uh, with their water. There are definitely places where the aquifer yields a lot of water and there are areas where the aquifer is either absent or it doesn't yield a lot of water. And so in Collier County, you can see that a bunch of the dots are all clustering in these purple and orange dot areas. And this basically means that most of the water that's coming from the groundwater is from the water table aquifer and the lower Tamiami aquifer, uh, as opposed to up in uh, Cape Coral area and Fort Myers, those aquifers really are not all that productive. It's, it's actually the mid Hawthorne aquifer and some of the water table aquifers is, is most productive there. So the whole overall graphic kind of shows you where there is very intense drawdown and intense usage of very specific aquifers within this lower West Coast area. Uh, and that becomes important when we actually look at how much more water is going to be available from each aquifer because the usage is so intensified in very local areas. And that's where our groundwater models come in. Uh, and we're gonna be modeling uh, to look at exactly how much future water can be made available uh, from these groundwater sources. 
So public water supply, um, the utilities that are actually providing water uh, in the Lower West Coast area uh, are actually, I think, very well run. Uh, and they've done a lot of diversification. Um, this graphic says a couple of things. Um, what it actually shows you is the quantity of water that all of the utilities in the Lower West Coast area have provided for the last 15 years. Um, the gray bars on the bottom are water that comes from the surficial aquifer. The dark blue bars are water that's come from the intermediate aquifer. And, and the light blue bars on top are water that's come from the Floridan aquifer. Uh, and over time, you can actually see that it's the surficial aquifer, the gray bars have really not increased all that much. The utilities have kind of gotten, most of the utilities have gotten off of the surficial aquifer system. Uh, so that they don't draw down wetlands and don't impact the, the surface environment all that much. And they've gone into the deeper aquifers, the intermediate aquifer, uh, and then the Floridan aquifer down at a thousand feet, which is brackish, uh, is providing a lot of the new water. The most, most recent water has come largely from the Floridan aquifer. So that's what those blue bars represent. The purple line that crosses all those bars is the population of the Lower West Coast area. And I think what that says is that as population has actually increased over that same time period, the water utilities have really not had to provide an awful lot of additional water. And that is a function of conservation and a function of smarter usage and expansion of reclaimed water. The actual potable water that the utilities have had to provide has actually been compressed as a result of conservation and the expansion of reclaimed water systems in this area. So uh, a little bit about the utilities that are specifically in Collier County. I thought you'd want to know about what your big water providers are, are doing here. Uh, this table's got a lot of numbers on it, but simplistically what I wanted to do, and we'll start with Collier County on the left here. Uh, the first row, the top row, is the quantity of water that Collier County utilities had to provide in 2020. Then when we do our projection for Collier County, by 2045, they're going to need to be able to provide 36.7 million gallons a day of water. Collier County Utilities actually has firm capacity. The actual facilities in place right now to be able to provide 52 million gallons a day. So that utility is actually very well positioned mm -hmm. to provide for future water. And their actual water use permit from the South Florida Water Management District allows them to, to provide up to 55 million gallons a day. So Collier County Utilities, generally speaking, is very well positioned to provide the water that the water that the people will need in the in the future in this planning horizon. Uh, Marco Island, uh, it's kind of a similar story. Marco provides a little bit, or in 2020 provided a little more than seven million gallons a day. Uh, by 2045, they're going to need to produce about 10 million gallons a day. The plant has capacity of almost 13 million gallons a day. Uh, and their water use permit also allows them to pump up to up to 13 million gallons a day. And Naples, 14 million gallons a day is what they did in 2020. They're going to need about 18 million gallons a day by 2045. They've got the water plant that's capable of providing 30 million gallons a day. Uh, and they've got a water use permit that just about gives them what they're going to need by 2045. So I think the utilities here are very well run. They got a lot of smart people working for them. Uh, and um, I think they're very well positioned, generally speaking, uh, to provide future water demands for people. Uh, and a little bit recla about reclaimed water. Uh, I think reclaimed water has been part of the story uh, where the utilities have not had to expand their potable water usage by all that much as a result of the population uh, because of the expanded use of reclaimed water uh, for irrigation. Uh, in Collier County, uh, there's about 25 million gallons a day uh, of rec reclaimed water that's being used. Uh, that's really smart. 
uh, for irrigation, uh, generally landscape and recreational irrigation uh, for parks, residential areas, and schools. So, uh, and, and all of the utilities continue to look for opportunities to, uh, uh, to expand their reclaimed water systems. And we, of course, encourage, encourage all that. So uh, this really is just the very early stages of this water supply planning process. Uh, it's really sort of just a kickoff meeting to let you know how we do, what we do, uh, and what our forecasts are showing. Um, we're gonna visit you again uh, in, uh, uh, in October when we drive the plan closer to completion. Uh, we've got another stakeholder meeting, like Tom said, uh, we do try to have the public be engaged and participate in this process all along. We have several meetings with uh, individual stakeholders, uh, local governments, and of course, we have a whole ton of analyses that we're going to be, be doing. Like I said, the groundwater models, uh, water resource projects. We talk to all the utilities and talk to them about what their future projects are so that we can capture how the utilities are going to stay out in front of, uh, uh, of the water demands that we're looking at. And of course, all the same time that we're looking at these future demands, we have to stay conscious of the fact that we do have environmental protections that are also in place, right? Resource allocation areas, um, MFLs, uh, all sorts of permitting processes that, are, that exist already. Uh, we're gonna have a discussion about what measures we do have to protect the environment while we are moving forward in this planning process. Um, so that'll all be uh, uh, discussed actually in the May stakeholder meeting. So. Uh, we'd love to have you click in uh, if you're available so that we can uh, we can show you the work that we're doing uh, as we move forward. And uh, eventually, uh, we're intending to have uh, this process move through this year uh, so that we can present uh, to our governing board in November uh, for approval of the plan. Uh, and so that's, that's the overall uh, project schedule for this year. And uh, with that, uh, take any questions that you might have. Okay, we'll, we'll go to board comment first uh, for questions for Bob or Tom, either one. Are there any questions from the board? Okay, I have a, I have a couple. Would you like, go ahead. I didn't see your light. It didn't Sorry. come in, Ms. Rivera. Go ahead, please. Bob, um, we talked about Marco having a, a more complex system because we do use brackish water as well as uh, uh, surface water. Um, the, the permitting for reuse water, what is the genesis of those permits? What the, what the utility requests, or do you set standards of what level of, of uh, treatment the utility has to put, put the, uh, sewer water through in order to, to be uh, uh, used as reclaimed. Who, who, who initiates the level of treatment of the reused water? It's, it's a DEP. It's a Florida Department of Environmental Protection program primarily. And they set the standards uh, for what reclaimed water systems have to, have to meet in terms of their water quality criteria uh, that, are, that are met. Uh, the district encourages the implementation of reclaimed water, uh, and we do look at that in the permitting process to see if the utility is actually providing some, some quantity of their demand through reclaimed water, but it's primarily a DEP process. So it's DEP who, who would drive for reclaimed water to meet uh, grizzle fig, for, for example. It, it wouldn't it's it's not the it's not the district. No, okay, their state laws. Okay. Okay, Vice Chair Waters. Um, thank you, Bob. Um, so I'm looking at slide 12, which is 12 and 14 are the two most interesting to me. 14 tells a good story of mm -hmm. we're we're assimilating a lot more residents in this area, but not pulling more water out of the ground as as they uh, come into our communities and our community gets bigger. Um, and so looking at slide 12, it's almost, we've, we've hit a, basically a plateau over the last say 10 years. Um, and so my question on that is, 
Um, are there things like, have we done the easy things that have, have got us the gains since 2000 to 2020, which are things like reclaimed water uh, for irrigation rather than potable and those kinds of things? Um, you know, and basically, have we exhausted all the easy things, or are there more things we could be doing and should be thinking about doing to continue to drop those bars of uh, per capita usage lower? Great question. Um, really, I think what the big impactor was was irrigation ordinances, right? Trying to limit the uh, landscape, the recreate world, well, home or recreational uh, or domestic. A usage of reclaimed water that in and of itself was uh, the ans landscape irrigation ordinances are our big deal. Um, so without a doubt, they've helped the per capita number come down. And would so for instance, on like on this chart from is this just simply what people use at their homes? Or would this include, you know, say a golf course that's pulling groundwater to irrigate uh, the golf course would a you know, reduction from uh, in landscape ordinance be reflected in this? These numbers come from home, uh, domestic homes. Okay, so this, this is public, basically just- Public service area homes. Okay. Yeah, this is this is the quantity of water that each utility has to had to provide for, for their, in, within their service area, which is largely homes, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's where those irrigate, irrigation ordinances have, have been implemented. Okay, so this would not include like golf courses, uh, in this chart. So this would be strictly what's passing through your meter, the customer buys it. Yes. I kind of look at chart 14 as more towards what you were talking about with uh, landscape uh, or irrigation ordinances where more and more golf course is getting developed, more and more people coming here, but we're limiting how often they can irrigate in times of shortage. Right. Okay. And replacing it with reclaimed. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Um, well, uh, my only observation Compliance and education um, it appears will be key, especially with new new people coming into our community that haven't been pr previously educated. So, uh, good presentation. Um, good luck with with uh, with the next step. I look forward to maybe I'll, I'll try to get into their stakeholder meeting on the twenty fifth of May. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bob. Really appreciate your presentation. I have a couple of questions. Could you elaborate a little bit about these? these public meetings and, and how you conduct them and how someone finds out information about them? Of course. Um, well, the public meetings that we have been doing have been via Zoom. Uh, and that's when the second, all of our stakeholder meetings will very likely be, be via Zoom. Uh, we just sent out uh, an email blast to 400 stakeholders in the Lower West Coast area uh, just two days ago. Um, so we maintain a massive database of anyone who's interested in participating. Uh, we try and be as broad as we can with uh, governmental agencies as well as non-governmental agencies and, and uh, residents, uh, whoever, whoever would like to participate, we certainly welcome uh, and, and encourage actually. You know, this is, this is a very transparent process. And just, just like you earlier today, talking about residents that came here to speak that's huge. That's really huge. We value that. And, and so by all means, you know, please, if, if, if anybody else would like to participate, we'd love to have them uh, participate. And via Zoom makes it easy. Right. Uh, and Bob, so, so somebody who's never done this before, do they go to the SFWMD website and sign up to be getting water supply notices or interest in water supply, do you know the easiest way to do that for them? Absolutely. Um, actually, the last slide. Okay, that's on the plan and okay. And, but how do they get signed up for the workshop announcements? There will be a link at, at the web page to okay. be able to go to the meetings. Okay, super. And I attended the first one and it's just as professional and understandable as what Bob and Tom did today. And it's great stuff. And I'm really excited because it really, it really impacts our community uh, in, a, in a positive way for us to do planning that, that's, that's uh, really uh, well thought out. And I appreciate that. And just as a second note, how many hydrogeologists are there that work at the district besides you? Roughly. I'd say about 30. 
about 20 30. Or 30. That's an, a, that's a, an immense brain trust. Yeah, scientists of that caliber that work at the district is just an incredible uh, bunch of professionals that can, uh, I guess, opine on this, right? And talk to us. About they're not as smart as me, but they're close. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, is, are there any uh, people signed up for public comment? Yes, Madam Chair, in the room I have Brad Cornell. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and, and board members. I'm Brad Cornell, and I'm here on behalf of Audubon Western Everglades in Audubon, Florida, and it's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. So um, thank you very much for the, the good presentation and information. I participated in the first stakeholder meeting. I'll look forward to the next one. Um, I had a couple um, notes. Um, first is, when you look at the six human demands in a water supply plan, um, you don't see the natural system or wetlands. And that because really, I think those um, wetlands and natural water resources underpin all six of those human demands. So it's important to keep in really on the top of our desk that, that as we do water supply planning and as the district does this, and I know they all pay close attention to this, that what we're really trying to do is avoid impacting negatively any of our natural water resources. So this is job one for, for this planning process. Um, second thing I wanna note is that conservation is, and there's been, been good discussion about that, but conservation is absolutely um, a critical priority in this. And I, I wanna flag that we have done, as Mr. Waters has pointed out, we have done some, some really good um, management of our demands, but we still have about 120 um, gallons per day per, per capita. And the, the national average, according to EPA back in 2015, is about 82. So we're well above the national average in terms of per capita use. And I'm suspicious that that's landscape irrigation. And I think that there's, there's a lesson to be learned there. We need to be thinking about messaging not only irrigation ordinances, but um, landscaping ordinances and, and how, we, how we treat our, our human communities in terms of what we use resources for. And so this may no longer be an affordable use of our water. Um, I also want to point out that, that Collier, um, excuse me, the Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary did modeling, as you all know, because you were partners with us and, and paid for and, and worked with us. And, and our, um, our consultants on modeling corkscrew swamp sanctuaries, hydrology issues. And one of the things that was identified that not the pre preeminent issue, but an important uh, factor was the combination of agricultural irrigation and public water supply as a big impact on corkscrew swamp sanctuaries. So as we look at water supply planning, that's an important factor. Um, and I also want to encourage, I, I see, um, a slight trend of improvement in terms of the lower West Coast getting off of surficial aquifers, but um, that's still, there's a lot of room to be improved in that department. And I would go back to the conservation admonition. We need to be doing a better job in order to reduce that demand on surficial aquifers. We need to be reducing our overall demand. Um, so thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you. Aaron, And that concludes public comment on this item, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for your presentations today. Appreciate it. And I think with that, we'll take a short break before the next item. Uh, it's 2.38. At 2.48, we'll come back and, and hear uh, item number nine. Okay, thank you.
everyone. Madam Chair, you have a live mic. Thank you, Ms. Keeler. And we'll come back to order now and begin uh, with uh, the next agenda item, which is the modeling update for the Logan Boulevard emergency pump operations. Akeen Awasana. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Roman, governing board members. Uh, I'm happy to be here today to give you a quick update uh, on an ongoing work effort at the district to develop an emergency operation plan uh, for temporary pumps to be situated at or around Logan Boulevard. Uh, first, a little bit of context and background. Uh, and I'll start with a quick timeline. Uh, back in 1992 and 1995, there was a fair amount of, of rainfall in this area uh, that resulted in flooding in the area around the Imperial uh, River Basin and the Kokohashi watersheds. Uh, it was very significant flooding, and at the time it resulted in the uh, development of a study uh, called the South Lee Watershed Study. Uh, that study has been revised a couple of times, uh, and the concepts that were identified there uh, have been uh, resurfaced uh, multiple times. Uh, back in 2011, there was an update to that study, and I'll talk a little bit about that update in a minute. But the image you're looking at uh, on the right-hand side of the screen uh, was uh, uh, taken back during the 1995 flood event, and it's looking south into the Waddington area uh, from Sanctuary Reserve uh, uh, RV Resort. Uh, this is in South Lee County. Anyway, just showed significant flooding that, that, that was observed back during the 1995 event. So I mentioned the 2011 update uh, to the Lee County study, uh, the South Lee Watershed Plan, and I'm showing a quote here, and I'm not going to read the entire quote, but I'm going to highlight four items uh, from this uh, particular uh, recommendation of that uh, update study uh, that I'd like to, to uh, bring your attention to. One, uh, the initial study identified this reconnection of the headwaters of the Kokohachi to the Kokohachi as a restoration opportunity. Uh, the second piece, it identified it as something that was necessary, not very commonly, uh, but during rare event, 25 year or 100 year type storm events. Uh, third, it identified the quantity, approximate quantities of 200 CFS uh, that was deemed uh, the, the uh, volume of water that needed to be moved. Uh, and the final piece I'd just like to highlight is as far back as uh, 2020 when this work was done, and even during the 21 study, at, uh, each of the times this has been looked at has always been identified as flows when the Kokohachi Canal system can safely receive the flows. Uh, it's gonna be an important part of my discussion with you today uh, because the plan we're developing is to try to write the conditions that will make sure that the cocoa system can safely receive the flows. Uh, so this is a schematic or a, a slide that I borrowed from a presentation given to our governing board in 2003 and it shows the concept when this work was initially done following the 1995 flood events. Uh, it shows, you'll see the area uh, where you now have, I think today you have Bonita National in this area, but these used to be farm fields. And at the time, what they considered as the restoration was to connect the headwaters of the Kokohachi uh, here in the cost crew system through these flowways in this uh, farm field which were bummed around at the time uh, to reconnect them to the woodland slough area and for onward transmission to the Kokohachi uh, canal system. Uh, what we're talking about today is a little bit different. Uh, these areas have since been developed uh, and the, they're still bummed around. Uh, the opportunity that's been looked at now is to actually take the water from the end of Logan Boulevard during specific events and, and uh, pump it directly into the woodland slough area for all one transmission to the Kokohachi Canal. So coming a little bit closer to current day, uh, in 2017, uh, there were two back-to-back -back, uh, events, uh, Invest 92L and Hurricane Irma in this area. And again, the same areas saw significant flooding, uh, both in Lee County and, and in Collier County. Uh, it was necessary to take emergency action at that time. And in Collier County, in the Coco system, I think also in Golden Gates, we installed temporary pumps uh, to move water out to tide. And uh, later on, after the event has had passed, we also deployed temporary pumps in Bonita Springs. And on the map you're looking to your right, uh, the dot that I'm showing there was the approximate location of the temporary pumps that were deployed in Bonita Springs uh, following Hurricane Irma. Then in 2018, 
uh, there was the opportunity to extend Logan Boulevard north into Lake County uh, from the county line all the way to Bonita Beach Road. And as part of that effort, uh, the city of Bonita Springs reached out to the district to get some technical support uh, in looking at the original impact of moving up to 200 CFS along a canal placed next to the Logan Boulevard extension. Uh, we did some modeling at the time, and that was the, the uh, last uh, effort the district did until the current project we're working on. I think the county and the city of Bonita Springs continue to explore these opportunities, and they have some, some uh, other efforts that were done beyond or after our 2018 study. So today, uh, I'm here today because the district and the city uh, entered into a cooperative agreement uh, that would allow both parties to work on solutions to mitigate flooding in South Lee County. Uh, the agreement was executed in February of this year, February 4th, and uh, it's in force for 10 years. Uh, the agreement has a number of important terms in it, and one key one is that within the first 90 days of the agreement, uh, the Water Management District will write an emergency operation plan or guideline for the city for their emergency pumps. Uh, the guidelines will tell the city uh, when it would be safe for the Kokoachi system to take water diverted or water pumped at the Logan Boulevard location. Uh, the draft emergency plan, as I mentioned, is due 90 days from the uh, agreement, uh, which means that by next week, I think uh, first part of, of, of May, uh, we'll be due to submit a draft of that document to them formally. Uh, so when we got this task, uh, we sat down quickly and strategized how we we're going to implement the, the, uh, the task. Uh, we assessed the work and Technically, it was a moderately challenging exercise. It wasn't that huge, but uh, what we saw immediately was that this task to be successfully completed would require a significant amount of coordination and collaboration. And to be successful, we needed some, uh, some guardrails uh, to be able to navigate the, the uh, communication and, and the coordination issues successfully. Uh, the next two bullets on the slide essentially were the key guardrails we, served, we set. One, uh, these were emergency pumps to be deployed during a declared emergency, and they had to be protective. Their operation had to be protective of the receiving system, which is the Kokohachi in this case. And the criteria uh, that will be set in the plan that we wrote uh, would be criteria that will be authorized by the Water Management District. So with those two key uh, uh, major guidelines, we went ahead and, and uh, implemented a plan development approach. Uh, the approach we chose was one that we would, uh, would use a very constrained method that leveraged real data uh, instead of modeling. We will use modeling, uh, but the idea was we wanted to come up with a plan that could be implemented without having to run a model during an emergency. We wanted to tie it to real observations that made sense to the various people we knew would be talking to about this plan. Uh, we had criteria for turning on the pumps. They were based on the state of the system uh, at different times. And we had criteria for turning off the pumps. And I list several of them here, but I'll highlight a couple. Uh, obviously, we felt that the pumps needed to stop pumping uh, if the emergency was over, uh, if the situation in, in Lee County had improved, or if there were conditions in Collier County that were uh, not desirable, if the system were re reversing, for example, and water level was going up instead of going down, or if we anticipated something like major rainfall and wanted to create storage uh, so that the system in Collier County could continue to provide flood control in that uh, part of the county. On the map to your right, I show a number of dots, uh, which were the areas we looked at through our models. Uh, the green dots represent area we looked at for criteria to be able to turn on the pump. Uh, the red dots were areas we looked at to be able to determine if the pumps needed to be stopped. And uh, the areas in yellow were areas we looked at in modeling to see how the system was responding overall. We put together a multidisciplinary team to do this work. Uh, it was a broad team to be able to handle the various aspects of, of uh, this particular uh, task as we saw it. We had water managers, people responsible for operating uh, the, the system here. We had engineers and modelers, uh, experts in hydrology and hydraulics, uh, we had people who were familiar with the regulation and permitting, 
uh, and folks who run the field operations within this region. Uh, we also had myself, Lisa and Phil, whose role in addition to just guiding the work was to make sure that the interagency coordination that needed to happen, happened. Uh, we've communicated extensively with the city of Bonito Springs. We've met a couple of times with Collier County and shared the progress of the work we're doing and the approach we're taking. And we've made a commitment to participate uh, in the previously scheduled uh, quarterly coordination meetings between Lee County, Collier County, the city of uh, Bonito Springs and the villages of Estero. So what work have we done to date? Uh, on this slide, I'm gonna kind of summarize some of the key things that we've done to this point. Uh, we've ascertained the current pump capacity available to the city of Bonito Springs. They have three emergency pumps, two with 12 CFS capacity and one with 41 CFS capacity. Based on those pump sizes, the maximum di uh, diversion or the maximum pumping they can accomplish is 65 CFS if they put all three pumps at the end of Logan Boulevard. Uh, in my assessment, I think the more likely pumping will be somewhat less than this. And so for the purposes of analysis, we looked at the maximum 65. We also looked at 41 CFS, which is a big pump located at Logan. Uh, and the belief is that if they do any other combination that's less than this, uh, any measures we come up with that are protective for 41 and 65 CFS will also be protective for the smaller volumes. Uh, the location of the pump, again, I showed a dot. It's in the end of the uh, Logan Boulevard Canal. And uh, the, the, uh, that's where we located the, the uh, pump. Uh, also, uh, for the purposes of coming up with how the criteria that we set, how those criteria are working, we looked at the, how the system responded pre-storm, during a storm, and after a storm. And we did that with or without the pumping, without the de uh, deviation, or the, without the diversion. So I'm gonna take some time on this slide and, and partly because I've been answering questions for a number of people. And, and I think this is an important slide for folks to understand. So when we took on this task, I mentioned that we put some guardrails in place. We knew that for this to be successful, it needed to be protective of the cocoa system, period. And so the way we set the effort was, what conditions must we see in the multiple places in cocoa that I mentioned, in the marsh, woodland slough, in the cocoa canal uh, portion, and in the tidal portions of Kokohashi, I mentioned that there were four dots. One was in the marsh, one was at Coco 3, which was the first part of the Coco that would see some of this water. One was at Coco 2, and one was at Coco 1, the tailwater side, which is the tidal part of the system. The image I'm showing on your right is actually showing several lines, and I'll try to explain all of them. First, this is an image taken from Coco 3, the headwaters of Coco 3. The lines on the graph represent water levels at the headwater of Coco 3 under different conditions, and I'll come back to those in a minute. The yellow band that you see is the operational range for Coco 3. Uh, over the years, we've developed operational range that reflect the strategy we have for operating this system. Uh, this is the operational range for the wet season, and it shows the, it represents how uh, water managers plan to make sure that we have capacity to be able to take and get rid of storm water as necessary, but that we do not overdrain the inland system. When water gets to the top of the, of the uh, band, we're actively trying to move the water out. As it starts approaching the bottom of that band, we're trying to close the structure to keep water in. And we have implement that strategy with water manager input all the way through the season so that at the end of the dry season, hopefully we're close to the top of the bank and we hold on to water and things continue that way. So what I'm showing here is that operational band because what we did to protect the system was to make a determination that the diversion or the pumping would not initiate until the cocoa canal returned to its normal wet season operational range. Uh, I'll spend a little bit more time taking a look at this. So the lines here, you're seeing a green line where my mouse is, is actually superimposed three different lines. One of them is black, one is blue and one is green. The blue and green are supposed to be dashed, the show of a solid here, but it, it's still fine, I can talk with this. So what you're looking at is at the beginning of the event, all of those lines lie on top of each other. It's the exact same system, there's no pumping, there's no diversion. We go across the yellow line into this band and we start to make a diversion, but you don't see a separation in these lines yet. As the water continues to go down, 
Eventually, the water that's been pumped at the Logan Boulevard location reaches the headwaters of Cocoa 3, and you start to see a diversion. And the blue line represents the 41 CFS diversion, and the green, the 60, 45, uh, uh, 41, sorry, and then the green, the 65 CFS uh, uh, situation. So essentially, what we're showing here is two very important things. One, we only take water when the system is back to its normal range. And the water we take doesn't take the system out of its normal range. It doesn't even take it back up. It still continues to go lower. It just goes lower at a lower range or at a lower rate than if we did not take a diversion. We kind of felt that this was the most uh, protective strategy we could implement. I mentioned that we looked at similar other things at uh, three other locations. And we looked at something that will be different for the fourth, and I'll speak to that in a minute. Uh, but we looked at three other locations and the Cocoa 3 location was in our opinion, the most stringent of the locations and the most critical to look at. That's why I've represented that in this image. Uh, we did the same thing in Cocoa 2 and we looked in the woodland uh, slough area. But for the tidal part of the Cocoa Hatchet system, we also came up with a metric. Now that part of the system is tidal. It sees when the tides come up, it goes up. When the tide goes down, it goes down. And instead of having an instantaneous number, we worked with the water manager for Big Cypress Basin and selected a number that we felt was protective. Uh, the, the type of levels at which we do not get complaints of flooding within that part of our system. So the, the, the criteria that we've set are those that we believe uh, we, we should be able to, to uh, implement in a way that will provide some assurance that the coach actually system will not be harmed by diversions from the Logan Boulevard uh, uh, pump. Uh, there's one more thing we've added to the draft document that we've sent out. And that is we've added uh, one uh, uh, additional requirement that at the discretion of the water manager from the district, uh, we could stop the diversion even all, if all the criteria were on the green side based on looking at the regional system. And this is consistent with the language of the agreement that we have. So where are we now and what are the next steps? I mentioned that the technical work is mostly done. Uh, we have a preliminary plan that we've circulated and we've started sharing with people to react to or respond to. Uh, I'm gonna take the initial comments we get and uh, wrap those into a final draft that we will submit uh, formally uh, early in May to meet the 90 day requirement. But that doesn't end our process. We expect that we'll continue to uh, test the scenarios uh, or suggestions that we get from critical stakeholders. We'll continue the discussion with the city of Bonito Springs, as well as with Collier County. And I expect that there will be a number of opportunities to address the public, including if you'll have me back, a chance to come back maybe at a later meeting to tell you what the more finished document looks like, what the results of the work looks like. Uh, it's only going to be after that, that we'll remove the draft from the document and, and consider it final. And that's the strategy that we're implementing at this point. And that's where, that's the stage we are in the project uh, as of today. And uh, with that, I'll be happy to take some questions and I expect there'll be many. Uh, thank you, Akeen. I think what I'd like to do is uh, board members, I'd like to go to public comment first. And uh, we'll begin with any elected officials who would, who would like to speak. And I understand that Commissioner Solis is on the line, Aaron, and he, he can uh, go first. Commissioner Solis, are you with us? He hasn't quite raised his hand yet, so he might not be in the room yet. Okay, well, let me know when he does, but I... I I'll do. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, public partner, I would say, would be uh, Trinity Scott, who's representing Collier County today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. Um, I'm Trinity Scott. I'm the department head for the transportation management services uh, for Collier County. I'm joined here today with Beth, Beth Johnson, our capital project planning director, and Rick Miller, also from capital project planning, as well as Amelia Robau from Robau and Associates. I want to take the opportunity to thank Mr. Akeen for spending and his staff for spending a lot of time with Collier County. Um, and providing the update for the draft operational schedule. And while we had a lot of questions um, and we weren't able to have all of those questions answered during our meetings, they did take 
a tremendous amount of time in, in fact staying until six o'clock one night because our meeting ran over. So we really appreciate that. Many of our questions revolved around flowway ownership, maintenance responsibilities and impacts to infrastructure. The Collier County Board of County Commissioners passed a resolution in 2018, which opposed the functional diversion of stormwater from Bonita Springs, Lee County, until a cooperative and coordinated review of all proposals related to the diversion was completed with Collier County, the city of Bonita Springs, and the Water Management District participating. We had requested that all proposals undergo a full vetting, including modeling, engineering, supporting science, water quality, alternatives to the diversion, impacts on the primary, secondary, tertiary, tertiary and estuary systems and surrounding neighborhoods and properties. And most importantly, we asked that a full public outreach be conducted. We understand that the emergency pumping and associated operations schedule does not require a rigorous permitting process, but our concern is what should be used for emergency purposes is going to become the fix. We will be requesting, respectfully requesting that the city of Bonita Springs provide an update of where they are in completing the priorities identified in the South Lee County watershed plan update of which this diversion was prioritized 11 out of 11. I'm very happy to hear Mr. Akeen state that this will be a draft document until we're able to get our comments in as well as comments from other stakeholders before the document is finalized. We stress the need to have public discussions with regard to this. Um, specifically with property owners. And in fact, we have been coordinating with the Basin staff about having Mr. King come to a future board meeting um, to present to our full, full board of county commissioners. Collier County has been willing to work cooperatively with the city of Bonita Springs and the Water Management District to determine options that are in the best interest of residents, businesses, and visitors. But it must be an open and transparent process with all stakeholders included. And I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity today. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. I do have Commissioner Solis with us. As a reminder, I think you're on your phone, so just star six to unmute. Commissioner Solis, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Good afternoon. Thank you. I, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but and thank you for your indulgence for letting me appear this way. Um, I'd like to just reiterate what uh, what Trinity Scott had said, and I'll leave the technical issues to her. Um, I, I think from from the the commission standpoint, uh, we feel that there are a couple of things that are of great concern to to the county and a lot of it has to do with the operation of of the system and and you know who is going to be or what agency is going to be in charge of uh uh turning off the pumps and turning off you know turning on the pumps turning off the pumps how that communication is going to happen uh and who it's going to be communicated to and i think these are all things that at least from our standpoint are not that clear in the plan uh and that we hope that that we could uh uh get more clarity on as trinity had mentioned we we very much and very respectfully would request that uh Akeen and, and anyone else uh, and, and even uh, uh, representatives from the city of Benita Springs would come and present uh, in at least a, 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 in a public forum in Collier County, since that's where the water will end up. Uh, you know, the analysis, the presentation made today uh, so that we can all understand and the, and the residents in Collier County can understand what the city of Benita Springs has been doing, why this is needed, and uh, and and how it's going to to actually work. Because um, 
specifically, and, and I know it's, it's more than this, but at least in my district, which I can speak to, the residential areas north of the Cocoa uh, One Weir and, and the other uh, uh, residential areas on the north side of, of the Cocoa Canal uh, experienced flooding during Hurricane Irma. So these are very sensitive issues. And we just hope that we could uh, get a little more clarity uh, as to how it's going to work, who's going to be operating it, and how the communication is going to happen. There's also going to be a lot of concerns about water quality and, uh, and, and how that's going to be addressed in the plan as well. So thank you for the time and the opportunity to speak to this issue. And I, I hope that we can uh, uh, collaborate uh, more closely and have some more communication on this issue that's, that's very important to, I know, to the city of Bonita Springs, but also to, to Collier County. And, and you know, we all want to be good neighbors, um, but I think we, all, we also want to be careful that um, we're not creating problems uh, you know, downstream, so to speak. I, I do feel very uh, uh, happy that the way Akeen has has created the parameters and how that's defined is is certainly more clear now to me. Uh, but I'm not an engineer, so uh, I, I understand how that works a little better. And I and I hope that that we could get more of an explanation of that uh, in a public forum to the county commission. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Solis, for joining us this afternoon. I appreciate your comments. All right, we'll continue with public comment for folks that have signed up in the room. Erin? Uh, yes, in the room, first, we're going to have Jessica Wilson, followed by Brad Cornell. Hi, uh, Jessica Wilson with the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, board members. Um, thank you, Akeen, for your presentation. And we also wanted to thank Lisa and district staff for their responsiveness in this. The operational plan and the Bonita Springs 404 permit application with DEP anticipate that flooding in Bonita will be addressed um, at least partially by pumping untreated flood water into the Coquihatchee system. And this appears to take flooding and flood control out of the realm of an emergency event and makes pumping to the Coquihatchee the standard operating procedure during times of significant flooding. The Conservancy does not believe that this is an appropriate short or long-term sustainable solution to the very real issues that Bonita Springs is facing. Even more concerning is that uh, neither the 404 permit application nor the district's operational plan consider water quality impacts. And um, essentially this untreated flood water would be pumped directly into conservation easement protected preserves that are part of required mitigation and will ultimately discharge into outstanding floor waters and uh, tidal ecosystem. The district and Benita can no longer ignore these issues and um, you know, essentially sending untreated stormwater um, and flood water down into the preserve and the Coquihatchee system is, is extremely concerning. Um, we also must not conflate hydrologic restoration with this emergency pumping. And um, I'd like to just remind that, you know, ecological restoration of regional flowways um, is not necessarily pumping untreated flood water south. Um, we're also concerned that the permit, the 404 permit application and the district's operational plan are two parallel processes. Um, Coordination with all impacted parties is crucial to evaluating um, and ultimately expediting a, a permanent solution to this issue. And it's also essential before anything moves forward. Uh, we understand that through this MOA between Bonita Springs of the district, there are uh, quarterly meetings with stakeholders. And we would like to ask that the next quarterly meeting serve as a forum for Bonita Springs to provide this much needed additional information to the impacted parties, including adjacent landowners, conservation easement holders, and the public. And in the interim, uh, we definitely agree with the concerns raised by Collier County. There's an immediate need for this open discussion, um, and we support the county's request to have the district and Benita present at upcoming commission meetings in May, and um, included in that presentation should be responses to county staff questions that were brought up. 
Um, finally, Benita and the district must take a hard look at permitting future development projects in the city um, that would put additional stress on the floodplain, the Imperial River system, and also the city's stormwater management system. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Cornell, followed by Peter Hill. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and board members. Again, Brad Cornell on behalf of Audubon. Um, uh, this is a significant issue that um, dates back a long time as uh, Akina Wasana has, has laid out in his presentation, which was helpful. Uh, Audubon's concern um, right off the bat is with the possible impacts to Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary and to crew wetlands and watershed resources from improper or unmodeled over drainage because of the use of these pumps. So I think we know that principle. You dump water to tide in the wet season, you don't have it in the dry season when you need it. And that gets at the whole question of what is an emergency and what is a flood? And we need to be careful about those kind of criteria. So the criteria that the district is bringing up is an important strategy. Um, whether they have addressed all of them is, is also a question. Audubon's also concerned and sympathetic with storm impacts. Um, we experienced them ourselves out at the sanctuary after Irma, but Benita Springs has an obligation to prevent storm impacts as well. There's preventive uh, strategies that, that need to be implemented and they have an obligation to move and keep development out of floodplains. That's a, a no brainer. And clearly that's one of the issues of defining a flood and, and an impact low impact development designs for the way we do manage stormwater and, and impervious or pervious surfaces in our urban areas, better stormwater management and using open spaces and land to build floodwater retention areas in urban areas and in rural areas and supporting the restoration of uh, natural flood attenuation that would also come under the name of wetlands. <laughs> so that clearly is, is a big strategy in a watershed like, like Benita Springs and Crew. Benita's Flor Florida 404 permit, as you heard from the Conservancy, is asking for more pumps than what the district has modeled, um, 90 CFS rather than 65 CFS, and a shorter time period after the any storm, like um, uh, and, and not adhering to the criteria that the district has, has placed in terms of capacity downstream, like in the Cocahatchies. And there also needs to be coordination, which I think everybody is underscoring. We need coordination amongst Benita Springs, Collier County, the Water Management District, Big Cypress Basin, landowners, including the Esplanade Flowway that we're talking about moving the water through, and Audubon. Without that coordination, it's a big problem. And finally, there's a bigger picture here, and that is, let's look at this whole region as um, benefiting from planning, both land use planning, but also restoration planning. This is gonna help us in every respect. And the Southern Crew Project is a great example of a portion of how to address these flooding con uh, concerns. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, Mr. Hill, followed by Raj Buxton. my iPad to death. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, board members and members of the public. Uh, thanks, Akeem. Um, you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to talk politics. I'm just going to talk about facts and clarification. I represent the HOA of Colliers Reserve. I'm the president of the HOA, but I also represent uh, an informal group of all downstream residents of beyond Cocoa Number 1, and the Cocahatchee River itself. It's very dear to me, it matters. And the Cocahatchee River is gonna play a huge part in the stormwater management systems of the future. It is the only outlet to the Gulf from Northern Collier County, and it's hugely important. And the one thing we don't know about it, we don't know enough of its capacity. How much water can this thing take? We've seen a desilting or a, a, a silting up in this last three to five years post, post Irma uh, markedly. And in my estimation, it's somewhere between 20 and 30% of silting that has occurred. You can't even get a boat beyond 
the 41 in high in in low tide uh, it's only at high tide and even then it's only six inches to a foot deep so there's been a huge amount of sorting up here and we need to know the capacity the modeling work has been done i know uh, what we need to do is see what is the light of the day uh, when can we see this uh, and when can we make comment on it and how can we model it in a better uh, in a better way it is at the moment uh, locked in in terms of, uh, of of dredging of the river itself. It's locked inside the uh, the Corps of Engineers and awaiting their approval. It's already been budgeted. I understand within Collier County, uh, we need desperately to see this. So we need to see the impact of the stormwater management system on the Cocohatchee River, and that to me is fundamental. Before you start any of this planning upstream, hugely important issues. Uh, and we need to, to, to take a very holistic approach here. So we as the residents are hugely impacted. It's us that flooded. And uh, what we need to do, this was flooding by man. This wasn't hurricanes. This wasn't storm surge. This was stormwater management. So we owe it to ourselves to, to, uh, to, to take this forward in, in, a, in, a, in a coherent way. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Mr. Buxton, followed by Meredith Bud. Very good presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm just a plain old ordinary resident that lives in North Collier County. And uh, I can remember in 18, uh, 2018, when uh, there was talk about this between Collier and Benita, and then Benita seemed to walk away from it. Uh, now they're back. They're back with a vengeance. And uh, I think we kind of got blindsided by this thing. Uh, appreciate everybody's concern about it. I appreciate what you've done, uh, but I don't think this should happen overnight. Uh, again, we got pumps that are more than what we need. Uh, Bonita gets rid of their problem and then North Collier gets it. No, I don't want Bonita to have a problem, but I don't want Bonita's problem in Collier County. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bud, and then we're moving online to Zoom. Thank you so much, Meredith Budd, here on behalf of the Florida Wildlife Federation. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, and Akeen, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it was very helpful and uh, appreciated to see uh, that the the comment period uh, to for the county to bring in comments regarding the operational plan um, will be considered before the draft is finalized for, for the plan itself. Um, I don't wanna be duplicative and repetitive. My colleagues uh, at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida and Audubon Western Everglades have articulated many of the concerns that the Florida Wildlife Federation has. Um, and I just want to elevate the idea that this is a bigger issue and a bigger problem. And I think we all need to be honest about how we proceed moving forward um, with, with stormwater impacts and flood control. And so looking at the bigger issue of land acquisition, um, are there incentives that potentially um, any governing body, Bonita Springs and or otherwise, um, that live in areas where we have these major storm events and we are in low-lying areas where we can do um, gravel parking lots and rain gardens and um, creative ways to store more water um, and and be more uh, be, be better at managing our water systems. And so I, I also want to elevate, I think Brad brought it up, the inconsistency between the 404 permit and the operational plan. Um, there are differing size pumps uh, in both of those. So there are a lot of still outstanding concerns and questions that I think need to be addressed. So I appreciate the opportunity um, that, that the Collier County Commission has presented to have joint meetings, bringing in Bonita Springs, the commission, all stakeholders, conservation easement holders. As I think Brad mentioned, the uh, Esplanade, the homeowners and the areas that are going to be impacted. And then the other point I want to bring up is that the emergency pumps would be presumably used in an emergency situation. And when you have an emergency situation and a declared state of an emergency, while you have parameters set forth in the operational plan, which are uh, very well thought out, and they help to prevent any sort of um, overcapacity of the system, those permit um, 
the permit requirements as per the plan are not necessarily enforced during an during an emergency during a state of emergency. And so that's something to be considered when you're looking at operating pumps in a state of emergency. So I think Commissioner Solis mentioned it in who was going to be operating these pumps. And so as we continue to look move forward, have the dialogue, bring in all the stakeholders and look at moving forward with operation of some sort of pumping, uh, perhaps the district can take a strong role in maintaining authority over those pumps to ensure um, equity in, in the operations. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and now we're moving online into Zoom, and we have Lisa Interlandi. And if you're connected by phone, you might need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Hey, it's Lisa Interlandi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Lisa Interlandi, I'm the executive director of the Everglades Law Center and senior attorney. Um, I just, I wanted to, I was trying to get my, sen my senses around how much water we were talking about here. And I saw 65 CSF, maybe maybe 40, 40 CFS, but you know I, I looked. I happened to look today at the Loxahatchee River, which is flowing at 41 CFS. Um, that's a lot of water. I mean, are we putting? Is this going to possibly put a river's worth of water through wetlands? It's it's not a small quantity of water. I realize it's not as much as many of the district's pumps and systems, but but this is a relatively large quality uh, amount of water. So. The other concern that we had um, was related to water quality. We haven't really seen a lot of impacts, analysis of the impacts on water quality. Um, it's kind of been so, somewhat conclusory. You know, I've, I've read the, the, what was submitted as part of the 404 permit application, and we really just didn't see any analysis beyond just a conclusory statement that there would be no impact. But we know that putting stormwater into wetland systems can have an impact on water quality. So we think that that needs a lot more analysis and to help people better understand whether or not this is actually something that's going to have an environmental effect or not. The other thing that I would just wanted to point out was that the receiving water body in this case is an outstanding Florida water. And so any significant degradation of the water quality in that area would be really um, inappropriate. So I think that a much closer look on the impacts of um, rerouting stormwater through the system into an OFW, what impact that that might have. Um, the other issue that I wanted to raise is that part of the system through which this water is going to be flowing is a mitigation area for another approved development. So to the extent that the, it might have a negative impact, you're impacting an approved mitigation area. The other part of it is that part of this area is also covered by conservation easements that require have certain requirements um, as to how how this part how the parcels must be operated and maintained. So these are other issues that we feel like need to be looked at before um, this goes forward. And then I also, you know, I also did want to reiterate that the difference between what is being proposed as part of the 404 permit with 90 CFS versus what was modeled and analyzed by the district. Um, that's a pretty significant difference. And that's, um, I think, something else that needs to be taken into account as, as this move for, moves forward. So, you know, I was, I was happy to see the hydrologic analysis that Akeen did. Um, you know, from a hydrologic standpoint, it seems like the parameters that the district just, you know, could put in might make this a feasible, um, feasible from a water management perspective. But yet, I feel like from an environmental standpoint, those questions have not been answered. The water quality questions, the impacts to uh, mitigation areas, um, you know, the, the impacts to wetland systems, and certainly the impacts to downstream users and OF outstanding Florida waters. So um, I hope that you all will continue to consider this and that the proponents of this project will work with the other stakeholders to get those questions addressed. Um, appreciate the opportunity to comment and we um, will continue to monitor as it goes forward. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you being here this afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. And that concludes our public comment. Okay, with that, uh, we'll open it up for uh, board comment. Any board members have any questions or, or comments? <clears throat> uh, Madam Chair, Tandy. Um, well, you got a lot of issues there. Um, we live uh, somewhat downstream from Coquihatchee. 
on Vanderbilt Bay, so we uh, we are impacted um, to some extent. Um, my, my feelings are a number of things that come to mind. First, it seems like this is an issue of longer term planning um, of, of what happens in, in storm situations. Maybe that should be considered in greater detail in the planning process of the various uh, developments. Second, I do remember uh, uh, seeing some of the homes that were flooded out after the last hurricane. Uh, and, I, and I feel for those people because their homes are basically wrecked in a lot of the areas adjacent to Benita Beach Road. Um, so that's one factor. And then I also remember uh, in a prior meeting we, on water quality that uh, the, uh, the area that will be affected by the uh, uh, pumping um, downstream of Kokahatchee uh, was already uh, receiving significant uh, heavy metals in, in the water quality report. So I'm concerned about that. Um, and then somewhat of a sarcastic comment, I just wish there was some way we could take this issue and put it with a prior presentation, but we're gonna get our water uh, in years to come. Maybe there is some type of solution there. So it seems like we have a lot of things to consider uh, on this one issue. Uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. Vice Chair Waters. Thank you. Um, just a, a couple thoughts. Um, one, I was, Kind of encouraged to hear the comments from everybody and, and and the tone of them that it was it was more collaborative than frankly i walked in expecting um and so that was good and I kind of and I went through my briefing and you know my first thought is you know why is is a keen uh sort of in the middle of this and it just sort of you know dawns on me that between a keen's technical expertise and uh what lisa does here locally as the face of the district you know, the district's going to have to be the neutral arbiter here that you know provides facts and and uh, uh, provides that communication. Um, it's pretty clear that you know, this is kind of a unique situation where, much like um, uh, when the expansion of the basin uh, was discussed a couple of years back, um, you know we had the just by I guess random luck we had our board meeting two or three days after the county debated it. Um, the Board of County Commissioners discussed it, um, and this is very similar. And so to watch the board meeting on um, uh, Tuesday, that part where this was discussed, uh, it just seems like there's going to be a need for a lot of fact-based communication, and I think that's going to be our, our role. Um, the, uh, the other thoughts I had are, you know, we've got an opportunity to build on a couple things that we've invested in the last couple of years. Uh, one is we you know, spent a lot of time and money on our level of service modeling. Um, and it has proven itself through Hurricane Irma and through the 2017 wet season. Um, and it has been proven to be accurate um, and something we can rely upon. Um, and so I, I think you know, that was a wise investment that allows us to not make guesses here, but have you know, good educated positions as to what the result of, of any uh, flow into uh, Collier County from Dina Springs would be. Um, second thing along those same lines is, uh, even if you don't trust the modeling, um, the fact that, that we have improved some of our wireless communication, uh, particularly with the microwave feeds, um, that will have uninterrupted observation of water levels, uh, gives us the ability to, to check this in real time if it comes to fruition. And I, I think that was was very wise, and I'm glad we're, we are where we are. Um, the uh, last couple of points is I think it was Mr. Hill's point is is a good one on uh, we're going to have to watch the downstream conveyance, both uh, the the Coquihatchie, um, and you know if, if capital work is needed to improve that for not not just flows from outside of the basin boundary, but even in the basin boundary, um, that's going to be to be important. Um, at the same time, the you know over the years, the this is probably oversimplified, but the way I've come to understand this is essentially you know there there are times where a volume of water hits that area of Benita Beach Road east of I-75, where the volume coming in is more than the Imperial can discharge, and so when the volume coming in is more than the Imperial can discharge, it's going to stage up on the land and it's going to result in flooding. Um, one of the things that I think would be appropriate from Collier County standpoint on this would be um, that 
the however frequently it is but as part of the district's coordination that they're doing in the cooperative agreement uh, the district also look at what the condition of the imperial river is because the less flow we can get down the imperial river the more need there will be to send this flow south um, and so basically you know we should uh, have a consistent view of not just what happens in the Coquihatchie River, but what happens in the Imperial and is it being maintained? Uh, maintained is probably not the right word, but is it available to flow and, and, and basically you're not going to have things that are going to cause issues in it. Um, the last point I would make um, is again going back to the discussion of the basin expansion. Um, you know, that sort of was a thing that at the time it felt like it got sprung on, on everybody here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think part of the time out on it and why it went away when it did was we all said, hey, give us a chance to work together and we don't necessarily need to go this route to do these things. And so that was, you know, also the reason I was happy to hear um, sort of the tone and, and the discussion that we had from, from all the interested folks was uh, that basically, you know, people are willing to work together um, and, you know, they're willing to get through this. Uh, if it doesn't harm the downstream users. And I, I found that uh, appropriate that it wouldn't be something where, you know, people are putting their feet in the sand and saying absolutely not, and it might lead to that coming back again. So that's basically all I have. Those are some good thoughts. Uh, I'll start with the expansion of the basin discussion that we had the last legislative session in 2021. And, and I, you remember correctly that as part of that, um, going away, so to speak, the district was charged with working with Bonita Springs and, and Lee County in addressing some of these flooding issues. I, I personally have visited the neighborhoods that experienced the worst flooding on, on, um, during after Irma there along Bonita Beach Road. I also visited um, the areas of South Crew in order to take a look at that. And we were doing maintenance on the Imperial River when I was there as well. And, and I, I walked the Logan corridor there along a Logan Road and, and looked into the actual conservation area that we're talking about sending this water. So I, I have firsthand on the ground knowledge of this. And, and I think that, that the issues that have been raised by, by both the stakeholders and the elected officials are, are very complex and they'll have to be worked out. And I think you, you kind of put your finger on it. We're kind of in the middle because we've got the basin, which is our, our board and what we represent. And yet the district was asked to work out some solutions to some of the flooding issues uh, for the Bonita Springs uh, uh, community. I have a question for you. Uh, a keen, and maybe this is your area, or maybe um, it, it's not, but uh, Trinity Scott brought this up. The 2011 agreement, the, the watershed plan update where 11 priorities were identified. Um, do, you, do you know whether those priorities were addressed or do we monitor those? Do we have an understanding of what's been done, what's not been done? Uh, yes, uh, several, I think there, there were 11 in the list uh, and recently uh, part of my preparation for this uh, project, I went down a, a, a recent publication that shows which had been worked on. I think the first six have been implemented. Uh, I think the uh, last batch all had things that had a little bit more to do. Part of why this hasn't gone any further uh, is the, the last part of that ask, which is you need to demonstrate that the receiving system can safely receive the, the flows. So that part of the work uh, was what needed to be done. And what we're doing here is writing some conditions for that, for that uh, receiving system. Uh, conditions that we felt that if met, uh, would would make sure that the cocoa system could safely receive some limited volume. So have we done any work on the coca that was raised by some of the public commenters? Have we done any work on the coca to understand whether or not it was capable of receiving any more water? Uh, yes, uh, but it was part of our level of service work where we were looking at future conditions that had additional flows coming in. But beyond that, we also looked at this in 2018, as I mentioned, where we looked at 200 CFS and demonstrated that if, it's, if the timing were right, it could. 
uh, think about it this way. The cocoa can take the uh, flow on peak. And on peak, I mean during the storm itself, what happens after the storm itself. And it would work hard to bring the system back to normal. Uh, it has sufficient capacity to move whatever it needs to, to move back to normal. And if you only add in flows when it's normal, it's not different than you had a rain on a normal wet season day. Uh, your, your canal is within the range you want, you bring in some volume into it. And so long as that volume doesn't take you out of that range, you are operating within your normal range. And if I misspeak, I think Brad would correct me and, and please do, but that's my understanding of, of uh, how we operate that system. And it was why we actually picked that criteria that when the system is back to where it should be, the way it's designed to handle runoff from the communities that drain to it, if you then add water within that space and you don't take it out of that range, then you are operating within its normal range. And, and so uh, within that normal range, yes, it can take flow. That's what it was designed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, when we, we modeled it, that was before, that's not been a recent review of that model or has it? it uh, we did it with this project as well. I mentioned that I wanted to limit the amount of modeling, but we needed to test the criteria that we came up with, with models. So we modeled the 65 CFS and the 41 CFS within the last several two or so months that we're doing this work. So there's been recent modeling that's been done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when I looked at the map that you showed, um, I don't know if we can get back to it or not. Um, I'm trying to think of where it was there. The, when it, probably towards the beginning, a keen of your presentation where you showed the, the um, probably one of your first, there you go. Um, it, the interesting thing to me is, is that there's now been development that kind of broke that up as you go into the, the um, six, slide six, the next slide, you can see how that, that development moved east and kind of broke up that flowway, that natural flowway that was there to treat, treat the water. And that, that makes it more challenging to get the water, water south, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I do need to make a correction. What you said is close, but not exactly. Okay. So uh, back in 2000, back in 95, uh, that area was burned off agriculture. The concept of the flowway was a, was a proposal of the study then that was never implemented. Uh, we, the, I think parts of it were built, but it was never operated. Okay. Uh, the berms are still there. It's just that instead of being a farm now, uh, it is now development. Uh, and, and so the water that would have naturally pre any development gone through that area now is funneled towards uh, the, the Imperial River. And, and part of this whole concept was take some of that water back and send it back towards the Kokohachi. But there's always been this caveat that says at a time when the Kokohachi system can safely accept it, because I think everybody from back in 99 till today recognizes that people live in the Kokohachi now. And whatever used to be pre-development flows may not be acceptable now, depending on the conditions downstream. So they all ask that you make sure that the conditions are right downstream before you make that diversion. And I, uh, maybe I should just volunteer something. I've spent some time talking to folks from Bonita Springs, and this is what they want to. Uh, what they've told me, the staff that we're working with, is that just give us the conditions when it is safe and okay to do it. It's not just when we need to get rid of water, it is when the system can receive it. And that's the one that piece of information. And, and so that's why we kind of feel very confident leaning as hard as we have on what is protective of the Kokohachi and the criteria that we developed. And then uh, I can see the concerns that, that Collier County has voiced in who, who makes that decision, who monitors that decision, who actually knows when conditions are safe and then you know, make sure that it's operated within those parameters. And I think that's one of the questions that they've been asking, who turns it on, who turns it off, and who knows when to turn it on and when to turn it off and who knows that they're following those parameters. And, and I, I think that's a, that's a big uh, important piece of this um, that uh, needs to be, you know, put somewhere in that operational plan as we work, work through it with all of the parties concerned. Um, the uh, other question that I had, I think I had had the other 
other, um, how, how were the natural systems taken into account around this area? Did, did you do any uh, analysis of, of the natural systems and the impacts with receiving this water? I mean, coming through that uh, protected area, that mitigation area. What we looked at was uh, limited to hydrologic response of that okay. system. So we looked at what happened during the entire uh, uh, event, the storm. Mm -hmm. So we saw the system go high and mm -hmm. start to drain. And so similar to the threshold that I showed for Coco Canal, there's a stage, and I think it's 14.75 uh, NGVD within a particular, uh, there's a new gauge that's been installed in the marsh just to the northwest of uh, Esplanade. Uh, we have a gauge there where the elevation has to drop to about 14.75 or lower before they can initiate uh, diversion. But usually what happens is that you reach that before you get back to normal conditions in cocoa, which is why I showed cocoa three. But there are conditions in the marsh that we represent by that one location that show that the marsh has recovered hydrologically, that the water level has receded. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Solis, is he on the line, uh, Aaron? He, he has asked to, to comment again, and I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Is he, is he there? Commissioner Solis, are you there on the line? He's logged in, but I don't see his hand raised yet. I can watch for it. Hey, Aaron, just prompt him again on how to unmute himself. It's star six. I think he's- um, I'm here. Okay, go ahead, Commissioner Solis. You're recognized. Thank you, and again, uh, thank you for, for letting me uh, <laughs> speak again. And, and I, I left out one important thing that I did wanna say, and, and uh, in what the comments you were uh, making, uh, Madam Chair, I think it relates to that. And that is one of the concerns we have is, is what's the, what is the, uh, what happens if it's not operated within the proper parameters? And what is the downside for whoever is controlling that to, uh, you know, what, what's the, the disincentive to not doing it properly. I, and I hate to use a double negative, but uh, that's a, a big concern because, you know, in an emergency, uh, we, we, we want to take care of uh, the most immediate thing. And, and we want to make sure that um, ultimately, whoever is in charge of uh, turning it off and on uh, really needs to do it within the parameters that are going to be set. There needs to be some uh, downside to not doing it properly. So thank you again for the, your indulgence and I, I apologize for speaking again out of order. Thank you. No problem. Glad to have you join us this afternoon. And I, I think you've got that as a takeaway uh, loud and clear, a uh, keen on, on that. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm sure that once we get together uh, the parties and we have these public meetings that we'll be able to, to walk through that to some degree. And so, um, I don't see any other board's hands raised, but I, I personally would like to have a, a copy of what we have in terms of that uh, uh, South Florida Water Management District in Lee County completed the survey, the watershed plan update and where we are on that. And maybe that, that copy could be provided to, to the other board members as well, if that, that would be possible. Absolutely, I can do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation. All right, we'll move forward to the Big Cypress Basin Capital Plan update, which should be something simple that we can wrap our, our head around, right? For sure. Hi, Lucene. Good yeah. to have you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Um, presenting today the capital program update, which will include updates to construction as well as design and the five-year capital improvement program. So the first project uh, for discussion is the skater replacements project. Uh, this one is complete. It goes through and um, replaces the Cork 2 uh, still, stilling well platform. It adds a stilling well platform between GG6 and GG7. 
and it adds a new site over here in DeSoto 10. All these sites are required to uh, collect stage water stage data uh, and to this, which in turn helps to operate the system. Um, and as you can see here, the pictures of the completed works. Contractor had mobilized back in August of last year and this work has reached final completion this past February. But I did want to provide some pictures of that completed work. So the next project that's in construction is the Cypress uh, number one weir structure. The original structure uh, is sitting in the Cypress, the Cypress Canal. And with the county's Vanderbilt Beach Road expansion, we'll move that canal south and required us to replace a deficient structure and move it into a, a location that's gonna work with the, with the relocation of the canal as well. So as you can see here on the left, this is a great aerial photograph uh, the contractor took for us. The concrete work is complete. The wing walls are constructed. Uh, we've backfilled around the structure. The stilling well platforms are installed. Uh, the gates were delivered this past month are being installed and tested. We uh, are waiting on the generator uh, and the and the additional uh, electrical and other uh, other ancillary things for the project that still need to be completed. So when I did this presentation, we're approximately 70% complete and we're looking at a final completion in October, approximately one month ahead of schedule. So we got a good one on, you know, on or ahead of schedule. That's outstanding. I mean, that's, that's one of the few Yes, it, very, very seldom that that happens. I'm very excited, uh, great contractor, great project manager, great team, et cetera. Um, this is going well. This is about a $4.3 million construction contract. So the next project is the remote operations, uh, what we call the electrifications package two, but it's really about uh, bringing remote operations to the cork two, cork two structure. This structure is the furthest structure uh, for the field station to travel to, to do gate, op, gate operations, which are required not once a year or twice a year, but all the time. So by doing this work, we are, um, we are improving our operations and maintenance, allowing staff to do other things that are needed across the basin. Um, and this also helps to hold water and move water in a timely fashion uh, and improves, protects levels at the corkscrew swamp. So we think that's an important feature. So the construction uh, notice to proceed was back in September of last year. We are currently 55% complete. The contract final completion based on uh, what's approved through uh, our contracts and procurement is July, 2022. We do have a delay with the FACA Union 5 generator, and this is the other side of the project. Um, this adds, this is going to add a, another building to add a generator, and this allows during storm time to have that backup power when power goes down. So all of our flood control structures, this is a standard to have generators uh, to be able to support downtime and flood control during those times. So this project won't be on time. <laughs> Started with the good one, ended with the, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so the next project, it, this is a corkscrew swamp headwater improvements. It includes, we started with, uh, we talked about in the past, we needed to install some stage uh, surface water monitoring sites to determine uh, what the stages are within the swamp so that we can get enough data to start modeling efforts. And with those modeling efforts, then we would move into design for the, the corkscrew uh, canal and cork three design and improvements that need to happen there. So two of those three sites are under construction. We uh, executed this contract for about $124,000 with USGS. It's not our normal style service water monitoring site because it's not a permanent feature. It's something temporary. So even though we talked about much larger dollars, the last time I was at board, we found a great way to get this done sooner, quicker, cheaper. And we're, 
we're happy about that. Um, so the next project, um, what I'd like to talk about a little bit more is remote operations across the board for the district, for the basin. So um, we have 34 sites that we manage and o o o for those 34 water control structures, 11 of those are currently remotely operable. Um, the more we can bring online and be able to push a button and have a 10 minute gate change versus a six to eight hour gate change, or you know, depending on location and how long that takes uh, is important to managing the system for flood control as well as water supply and trying not to dry out the system in the dry season. So um, two sites, uh, County Road 951 South, as well as Henderson Creek number one, uh, SCADA designed the, the change out for remote ops panel upgrades for these two sites. Field station came in and supported them and they, they pulled new conduit and cabling. And this month we'll be up and running with two more sites in remote operations. In addition, we'll have the Cork 2 that's in construction as well as Cypress number one will also be remote operable by the end of the year. So that adds four structures to the system. I think that's great news overall for everyone, the field station, water managers, et cetera, and the public. Uh, the next, um, what we call package two, the SCADA Stillingwell platform replacements at three more sites will be the end of the big, the larger work that we need to do for SCADA. Um, this package was, which was, went out to bid in March and we actually opened up the bids today. Uh, it was estimated at 650,000, the engineer's estimate, and we came in with two bids at 650 and 670. So we just received the email, it's great news. We're on target with what we, what we estimated. We still need to go through responsive and responsibility checks before we can execute an award. The next project, uh, this project is in design. It's the Lake Trafford Tower uh, that was presented a, a board ago. Uh, this adds a tower into the system that brings BCB uh, into the, the microwave loop and increases our communication reliability. This takes us off of cellular, um, which will result in improved flight control and response time. As you know, during Hurricane Irma, we lost site of all of our structures because the cellular towers went down. Um, this will be done internally with in, internal design engineering staff. Uh, so this will be helpful in moving forward and quickly and trying to meet our deadlines on this project. Um, we've been working on the microwave path analysis, uh, geotech survey, as well as wildlife assessments. And we are estimating a preliminary design submittal in November of this year. And hopefully governing board, uh, September of 2023, the following year. So um, we have two new starts in fiscal year 2023. And that includes the I-75 canal weir number two replacement. This is an older structure. Um, as you can see in this picture, if, if it's not too difficult to see, um, this is more of a weir structure, doesn't allow for operational changes. Um, so a new structure is gonna be remotely operable. It's gonna reduce our operation response time for any changes that we need to do. Uh, improve dry season groundwater recharge as well as uh, reduce dry season discharges to Naples Bay. And we have budgeted approximately 300 to 350 to start design. The other new start for fiscal year 2023 is the upper FACA union replacement. Uh, this would start with modeling to support this, this canal and it takes three older structures. If you can see how old these weirs are with these V notch, uh, V notches in here. And most of the time they don't come out, they're stuck. And so it's not really, they're not really operable structures. And then over here on the left, you can see FACA Union 5, which we are trying to improve with the generator building, uh, has 12 gates with vegetation stuck in the gates. So the plan is to remove FACA Union 6, 
uh, replace FACA Union 7 with an operable structure, and then reduce the 12 smaller gates in FACA Union 5 with six larger ones. And we've currently budgeted about approximately 500,000 to start that modeling and design in 23. And so with that, we move on to our five-year capital program plan update and our uh, fiscal year 2022-23 proposed tentative change from preliminary. Um, I'd like to say that back in 2014, the basin has always had a capital plan, but back in 2014, we formalized it. We, we went out, we inspected all the structures, we gave them a risk score, we ranked them, and we created a capital plan. And since then, it's just expanded and expanded, and it's a great program. It's how we do everything in the, on the, other, in the CNSF system as well. Um, we institute it all at the same time. Um, the program is bigger than it ever was, and we're moving on a lot of things. And so to do that, we do need the structure inspection program, which is partially internal staff as well as uh, external consultants. And that increase is 250 from 225 to 250 in the following year. And it's two years of inspections. And that's that's every five years that that happens. In addition, uh, increase the SCADA additions and replacements to help offset pack this package two that's come in. Um, to, we're gonna multi-year fund it in with 22 funds and then 23 funds. The remote monitoring and communications includes the Lake Trafford Tower. So these costs include construction for Lake Trafford Tower in 23 and 24. And we've moved the operations control center for the Collier County out to 25. For canal improvements, we're looking to start design on Cypress. Um, this is uh, some Cypress improvements. So this will start some design and then some construction. And then out years include improvements to Faka Union, as well as I-75 Green Canal and the C-1 Connector Canal. And as I mentioned before, Corkscrew Canal headwater improvements. This starts design after the modeling is done. So we'll have 23 up to 23 to finish the modeling, 24 for design, and then out years for construction in 26 and 27. And so on and so forth. What you what is new on here is the Henderson Creek replacement. Even though we uh, the portion of the structure that is operable, we went from local control to remote ops. That's that's going to help us out in the next few years. But with the level of service and the sea level rise analysis, we determined that the structure is going to need replacement, and the gates need to be at a higher elevation to help with sea level rise. So it is a coastal structure, and it will be impacted. And we've already made that determination. So we're looking to start design in an out year of starting 2025. And with that, I just want to give you an update on where your multi-year budget is. So currently what we have moving, we have a consumable budget of 8.5 million. We've expended four and a half of that. We've in, that we have encumbered about 3.35 million and an available budget left of 668,000. So we're doing pretty good. Usually I give you a current year number, but this is just how I see it on a daily basis and you know, multi-year, everything that's been encumbered and what's moving. Great, thank you for the excellent update. I can't say, emphasize more how important these SCADA upgrades are as we go into wet, wet season, you know, that saves um, the field station guys from having to dispatch somebody to go way out to one of the canal gates and physically move it up or down. And um, it, it just saves so much and makes us so much more efficient. Plus, we can do more things in a shorter period of time. So that's been an investment by the board that's really, really paid off dividends. And, and thank you for all the management of all of these projects. And and keep us keeping us on track to get to where we want to go. Really, really appreciate it. Do any of the board members have any any questions? I don't see any. Just want to be sure. Is there any public comment, no. Aaron? On the, go ahead, Andy. Oh no, I, I have no comment. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Aaron. Any public comment? I have no public comment, Madam Chair. Thank you for the update, Lucene. I really appreciate it. 
Okay, the next item is the Lake Trafford Project Update, the Phytoplankton Monitoring Project by Florida Gulf Coast University. And we've got Sean Meyer uh, from the Basin staff and also Dr. Barry Rosen from Florida Gulf Coast University. And it's great to have um, Dr. Rosen here today with us. Sean, do you wanna kick it off? Yep. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, board members. Um, Pleasure to see you again. Um, so going to do a little brief introduction of the phytoplankton monitoring project that was carried out by Dr. Barry Rosen. Um, the Lake Trafford management plan was completed by the team, the management team in 2018. Once this was completed, the Big Cypress Basin board at the time directed staff to allocate funding for four years to assist with restoration efforts on the lake which remains impaired for nutrients. One of the action plans or action items that the team identified was to look at phytoplankton communities in the lake with the hopes of gaining a, a greater understanding for harmful algal blooms and, and what triggers their occurrences on the lake as they can have detrimental effects to humans and wildlife. The team, the Lake Trafford management team voiced their support and approval for this project at their meeting in September of 2020. And then the funding for this project was approved by the board um, a couple of months later for about $37,000. So this project has recently been uh, completed. It was carried out by Dr. Barry Rosen with, and his staff at the water school at Florida Gulf Coast University. And um, Dr. Rosen is here today to give you an overview on the project and discuss his findings. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. <clears throat> As it says here, our, I work at Florida Gulf Coast University and we did this small study on Lake Trafford. And again, it was part of that monitoring plan that Sean just talked about. Um, HR6 included zooplankton and phytoplankton. We just did the, the phytoplankton portion. And we added a few more questions besides, okay, what are the phytoplankton populations doing out there? What's concerning is, are there cyanotoxins in Lake Trafford? And can the current nutrient le levels influence that cyanotoxin production? And can toxin gene detection serve as an early warning? So we added some more finer tuning to understand that. Again, we had, um, here's Lake Trafford, there's the three sites that were, we got the monthly samples from the Collier County Pollution Control. They were stored on ice and brought halfway to FGCU and we went down and picked them up. One of the interesting things that we did was to photo document all the organisms that we encountered in the lake. So you now have a photographic database identified by me of what organisms are present. That did not exist before. I, I looked at Lake Trafford back in the 90s when we had that big fish kill before they did the dredging project. It's not that much different. So besides identifying the organisms, we also quantified them. In other words, we counted how many organisms there were per milliliter. Um, that we did by microscopy. And the way you do it is each row in an Excel spreadsheet is a sample. Again, we did this monthly from three sites. And then to keep track of what organisms are what, you take a picture, you insert it in a column, and that way you can tabulate how many there are of every organism. Besides doing it by microscope, we did it by some other methods. What's really interesting is if you look at the dominant organism by number, relative abundance, cyanobacteria by far dominate the lake year round. So you can see there they are year round. They're the top number of organisms in the lake. There's a little bit of green algae and there's some diatoms. So besides relative abundance, um, we promised we would try a new tool called an imaging flow cytobot this machine allows us to look at a greater volume. When you're doing counting, you're looking at a tenth of a mil, it's hardly anything. But with this machine, we can look at two full mLs. It takes an image of every single organism. And then through machine learning, it can then classify and we get a thousand images. You can then say, okay, 264 characters per image is enough to, to get these things named and named right. 
So again, it really showed not much different. You've got the same trend here, but what I, if you can just remember what that black line looks like, here's the blue line, which is just the cyanobacteria. Again, it's the dominant organism in Lake Trafford. So let's talk about toxins. There's families of toxins in the sense that these families cause harm. You have the liver toxins or hepatotoxins. You've got the microcystins, and there's over 300 variations of that. You have the nodularians and the, the cylindrospermopsins. You've got both of those in the lake. You've got the neurotoxins, anatoxin, guanatoxin used to be anatoxin AS, and saxatoxin. And then you got the toxins that if they get on your skin, lingbiotoxins, the dermatotoxins. And there's a new toxin that we're um, still understanding more about. It's called BMAA. But last time I was in this chamber, that was of major concern because people are concerned about a compound that may cause ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. Not saying it does, but there is a lot of indication that it's involved. So I want to put these toxins in perspective, the saxotoxins, and this is micrograms of the toxin that would kill you if, per kilogram of body weight, and that's 50% die, so the other 50% are fine. Uh, no, I'm joking around. My point is saxotoxins are the most potent naturally occurring cyanotoxin the only thing more potent naturally is racine from castor beans. Saxotoxin is the only thing Department of Homeland Security is trying to regulate. They don't want people growing this or, or doing anything with it. Guanotoxin, which is a neurotoxin, also 20. Well, that's as potent as cobra toxin. You got plenty of saxotoxin and guanotoxin in the lake, by the way. You've got microcystin LR. That's the one that's regulated in drinking water and recreational use. That's about 50 micrograms per kilogram as it's LD50. Still a lot, a lot worse uh, than Karari. You know about Karari, right? And you know about strychnine. So I'm just putting into perspective. Keep in mind, these compounds have to be ingested. We know that there possibly is an effect from inhalation, but we're still working on that. I've got funding from the Department of Health to look at inhalation studies. So let's go, I just named all these toxins. Guess what, they're always in the lake. They're always there year round. So there's some out there and um, we measure these toxins by an immunoassay called ELISA and they're there. And this is just some, some quick look at it. These are something called box and whisk, whisk, whisker plots where the black line is the median and the range is, is the line on top and bottom. So that's not enough. I had promised that I would try to understand what is stimulating toxin production. If you've got cyanobacteria, blue green algae out there all the time, what is stimulating them? So we did something called algal growth potential. Water comes back from the field. We set up 24 flasks in triplicate. So three controls, three we added nitrogen to. That's a nutrient they, they need. Three we added phosphorus to. And three of those, we added both nitrogen and phosphorus. It's called algal growth potential because I want to know, did it stimulate the growth of these organisms? Did it stimulate the production of the toxins? Because of all the knobs you have to control in Lake Trafford or any lake, nutrients are probably the easiest to control, unless it's a, a non-regulated source like agriculture. So lo and behold, if you look at the whole year of study, we found that it was pretty much co-limited. Both nitrogen and phosphorus were important and they both needed to be added. Again, this was the whole year, but I'm gonna break it down a little finer. I wanna show you what happened a little bit more on the seasonal level because it flips a little bit. So nitrogen is definitely limiting most of the time, but so is phosphorus. And the distinction between the two gets a little gray, but you need both those nutrients and they're called macronutrients. So you need nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so we can say there's co-limitation most of the year, but certain times there was not. It was, it was one or the other, either nitrogen or phosphorus. Mostly it's nitrogen limited. So we've got these for every month for you all to look at. 
It'll be in the final report. But remember, I added nutrients to these flasks. I let them grow for seven days. So you have to say, okay, but you had organisms growing and you had more toxin. So one of my grad students came up with a clever idea is that if the organisms, um, the number of organisms kept up with the amount of nutrient you're added, you would have the flat line, the one-to-one -one relationship. But if your numbers showed more cyanotoxin per number of organisms, you stimulated toxin production. And sure enough, if we look at microcystins, that's the one compound that we care most about, it's the most common, we stimulated with the nitrogen treatment way above expected. You go, well, why did that happen? Well, it's simple. Nitrogen is a critical component of the microcystin molecule. So you added the nitrogen and you get more microcystin production above and beyond what we expected those cells to have in them. Phosphorus, it didn't do it. And NNP alone uh, together didn't do it. So there's something about adding that nitrogen to the water stimulates the production of microcystin, the compound. And there's a lot of the organism, microcystis, don't be confused. That's the organism that is likely making that compound. To do this, we did both the imaging flow cytobot and the ELISA test. So we were able to combine those two things together to squeeze out an interesting result. So microcystins are one compound. The other is a cylindrospermopsin. It showed the opposite trend. Phosphorus was a critical compound for that toxin to be produced. And again, above expectation. And you can see that the standard error shows just above that line. So we know that it's, it's valid. This is new findings probably for the world and we will publish this because it's, it's a really clean, interesting experiment. Saxotoxin, yeah, it didn't really matter, nitrogen or phosphorus, but the combination really didn't do much. So we have those data for all of them. And, and lastly, for anatoxin, again, it didn't seem to cause a particular effect. So the real story is with the microcystin and nitrogen and phosphorus with the cylindrospermopsin. Say that fast. All right, the last thing that we said we would do is figure out, is there a way to look for toxins before there's enough in the water to test it? In other words, if I have to have 100 grams in the water, can I see it sooner? And we can do that with genes. Nowadays, we can detect things much quicker with genes. So basically, you have to take the DNA, you extract it from a sample, but then you amplify it 100, 200, 500 a million times and see if the genes are there for the potential to make the toxin. And we I showed you a part of a simple table down here and we see yes, yes, no, no. We can tell when the toxin genes are present. Which again, if you had some way of controlling the blooms in the lake, that'd be very useful. Oh, we don't have any, it's, it's November or December. We don't have to do anything. And you do that by using this specialized machine that's the PCR machine you've all heard about, PCR from COVID days, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so in conclusion, cyanobacteria are dominant all the time in Lake Trafford. February and June seem to have a couple of peaks. Cyanotoxin, the cyanotoxin microcystin follows that same pattern. When the organisms are peaking, the cyanobacteria are peaking, so does microcystin. And four major types of cyanotoxin are in all those four ones, those major categories are in the lake. Genes are able to be amplified and tell us there's a potential to produce toxins. It's not the toxin itself, it's the potential to produce it. Nitrate stimulates microcystin, phosphorus stimulates cylindrus from opsin. And overall, the lake is co-limited by both of those nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then there's no simple solution to treat the cyanobacteria, just know that. You kill off one species, another one's gonna pop up. It's not a simple thing. And again, cyanotoxins, cyanotoxins really need to be ingested um, directly from the water, which if you're not using it as a drinking water source, it's usually not an issue. And then the aerosols are unknown and that exposure route would be from recreation. So the bottom line is when you go to Lake Trafford and the lifeguard isn't there, you have to make sure the bacteriologist, the microbiologist and people like me, I'm a phycologist, 
that's not psychologists, although I study the psychology of algae, um, are, are not on duty. All right, thank you. I kept it short because it's late. Dr. Rosen, I, I really, really appreciate you being with us this afternoon and certainly sharing world findings, uh, new things that you've discovered. I mean, that is just tremendously exciting and I can't thank you enough. I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, you mentioned that cyanobacteria is dominant in the lake. And then you mentioned a term BMAA. What, what was that in relationship to? So BMA is, is a compound that's kind of new on the scene. It's the one down here on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So BMAA, the full name is N-methylamino-L-alanine. Mm -hmm. It is an amino acid that we don't make. We have 20 that make up all of our proteins. But cyanobacteria and many aquatic organisms have a whole cadre of other amino acids. They're primitive organisms. And BMAA is one of them. And the idea is that it, it can fake out our systems and we may accidentally take it up in the vulnerable and if it happens up in the up in the brain, the idea is that it could get across the blood-brain barrier, misincorporated into the mechanisms that are making proteins in our brain. Mm. And if that happens, you've brought in the wrong amino acid. And it's that sequence of amino acids back to biology 101 that leads to proteins folding the right way. And guess what? ALS, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's are called. Uh, they're, they're called folding disease. There's a misfolding they think that is going on. So that's one of the hypotheses. It's not been proven, but that is one of the hypotheses on the mechanism. Since these toxins are found in the lake uh, all the time, basically some form of these toxins, um, if you're swimming, you could ingest these toxins. Is that correct? That's the recreational exposure that, that EPA has guidance on. Now, is there a public health risk in, in relationship to these levels in, in Lake Trafford? Probably not, but we didn't really get a very severe bloom. So mm -hmm. certain times the bloom is much higher. Now, BMA is not even part of that thinking. There's only two compounds that EPA provides guidelines on, the cylindros from opsin and the microcystins. And it's much lower for drinking water than it is for for recreation, recreation is much, much higher. Now, the last you mentioned the last time you were before the Basin Board briefing on a bloom, was it? It wasn't the Basin Board. It was the Collier County Commissioners. Okay, okay. They so, just wanted an understanding of, of, of this. Okay, all right. I, I was just going to ask you for a little bit of history there. Um, the last time I was at the water school, yep. I was visiting the laboratories with Greg Tolley, Dr. Greg Tolley, yep. and he took this small group, me included, uh, to where you work. And, and he showed us your microscope. Yeah. And I've got to tell you, I've never seen a microscope so huge in, in my entire life. And what it would take to operate that and, and to actually research the work that you do is, is just incredible. And the fact that you were able to come here and make a presentation that was easily understood or at least pretty, pretty approachable, all right? For those of us who paid attention in science class, maybe a little bit, um, it is just remarkable. And the fact that you're a partner with this, this basin board in doing these projects at Lake Trafford with us, I, I hope that that will continue in, in the future because that is, just, that is just amazing work that you do. And, and really for the purpose of protecting public health. And I think that's the important, important point here. Do any of the other board members have a question for Dr. Rosen? Go ahead, Ms. Rivera. Dr. Rosen, I found your presentation and your slide set very uh, eye-opening and enlightening. Um, for the rest of us who do not have these microscopes nor a cadre of graduate students to collect the samples and grow it for seven days, et cetera, et cetera, and we um, live by the water and recreate in it all the time, 
what what are you recommending for a county or a city to do to make sure that that we're not uh, taking a dip in the wrong place? Well, the, the saying that the Department of Health uses, which is good, if it's if it's green, keep out of it. So, are you being exposed from the air if you're if you have a, a wake or if you're um, jet skiing or something like that, yeah, you're going to breathe quite a bit of it in, but there is no long-term monitoring. You know, you could put out sensors. I have some sensors deployed in Pahokee Marina. I can look every 15 minutes and figure out how those organisms are responding, um, how they're growing. And you get a, a big enough signal from that. You say, okay, now it's time to actually go collect a sample and measure the toxins. That's about the only way you could be a little more proactively preventing an issue. But you know, right now, I think there was a bloom, I want to say 2019, somebody finally called and FDEP came down and, and got some samples. But you know, that's a long route towards, I'd like to know now what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you have real-time sensors that they use for red tide. We, we could equip you for, with that here easily. Yeah, well, I live down in Marco Island and we've had a, a specific uh, set of birds that for a couple of seasons now have developed an illness and like 50% of the chicks have died, um, which is the perennial canary. The coal mine. And the coal mine. Um, so, what systems do we need to trigger to get more proactive in, in then understanding what, what's causing this uh, bird population to be diseased? Some of that is um, not from, probably not from blue green algae, but you know, if they're in marine, they're gonna, they could easily get you know, the red tide organism, Corinia brevis. But there's cholera that happens, avian cholera, which is fairly common and it causes a lot of mortality. So it, it takes a, a wildlife biologist and a pathologist to figure out what's going on with them every year. So the chances of, of algae doing it are, are a little thin. As a matter of fact, we don't see fish kills even with all those toxins. It has nothing to do with the fish kills. It's low dissolved oxygen. You get a big biomass, big bloom, lots of organisms. The bacteria chew up those organisms. They cause a dissolved oxygen sag that's so great they can't fish can't get away from it. So the fish kills that happened in, in Trafford in the 90s, it was low dissolved oxygen. Dredged the muck out, that helped quite a bit because there's that nutrient source that causes the bloom. But it's not the toxins. A lot of people won't tell you that. You know, they want to point to the toxins. It's not. So... Human exposure is a, another story. And again, you don't hear about deaths of humans from the cyanobacteria, not very often. So. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I had a, one of the questions uh, that I had that you sparked in your comments to Ms. Rivera was the fact about a sensor in the lake. Yes. What uh, deploying a sensor in the lake would do, tell us what? So you can have a sensor that depicts the relative fluorescence of what's called phycocyanin. It's going to be only the cyanobacteria have it. So there's a few other organisms, but the greens don't have it, the diatoms don't have it. The one I have in deployed in Pahokee, every 15 minutes, it sends a signal up to a satellite. It's uplinked to a satellite. And I have on my computer in my office, I see a display of the phycocyanin. And I have control sites and I have experimental sites, but you could keep track of that. You could use phycocyanin and you could do chlorophyll A at the same time and you could compare what's going on, what's growing out there. Mm -hmm. And you could say, well, at the, above this threshold, we really need to stay, take a closer look. Come put your boats in, get some water, help us figure out if we have a toxic event going on. Okay. So that's what Very I would do if I were a lake association or something like that. Now, the, the one thing that you briefed us on was that you showed that chart where nitrogen 
really amped up the microsystem. Yep. So could you make an analysis with that, that uh, uh, sensor and with the water quality component of that in the lake to show an increase in ni nitrogen? They do have nitrate sensors, I do know that. Or our water quality monitoring may show nitrogen as well, you know, the regular monitors that we use. So the nitrogen increase is what they need to make the microcystin. That's probably why you had a pulse in February. So up north, that would never happen because it's, the ground's still frozen. But down here, depending on what ag is doing, what pulses from the watershed into the lake. But even that, I don't know if that would do you any good, honestly. That's, yeah, okay, nitrogen is coming in. Yeah. Until you see the response of the organisms, because nitrogen might be one of the triggers, but there could be other things. If the wrong organisms are there that can't really take advantage of that nitrogen, and I didn't tell you this, but you have organisms in the lake that actually fix atmospheric nitrogen right out of the air. They don't need to get it from, from the water itself. Um, some of the ones down here, you've got the cylindros formopsis in your lake. That's right. The phantasomenon in your lake. <clears throat> the only ones that really can't are the microcystis group. They, they can't fix their own nitrogen. Mm -hmm. But the other ones that seem, this big one here on the left is called microcystis novechiae. And it's dominant, or at least there most of the year. So is and that the microcystin maker? I would, you know, if I were doing more on this, I would pick that organism out of the water grow it alone and see if it's your microsystem producer, because that wasn't part of the study, mm -hmm. but I do that for people all over the country. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to see what other uh, future projects we might be able to partner on. That's, that's why I was asking those questions. And I know Sean will be talking to you uh, about that and with the Lake Trafford management team that oversees our plan. So that, that's great to know. I really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, and I didn't even bring my attache, which is weird. And no, that's okay. Get two vending bag machine foods because you're past my bedtime. <laughs> well, we appreciate the sacrifice and you being here today with us, Dr. Rose. Come on, you must have. No, I'm good. Let's thanks. move the water around differently. Maybe <laughs> I, I spark up. Let's move the water differently now. <laughs> any other questions? Is there any public comment? I have no public comment. Okay, Madam great. Chair. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen. Really appreciate it. Okay, that brings us to our, our first uh, board comment period. So Madam Chair. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Hill. Uh, Madam Chair, I have two things. First, I'm coming to you uh, from uh, Isle Murata. My wife and I are celebrating our 25th anniversary this week. So we're taking a, a, a vacation in Isle Murata. So um, I think my uh, connection has only uh, interrupted about twice so far as I don't think the cellular system has made it to, uh, to where we're staying yet. Uh, second, most importantly, I would have uh, addressed this with you personally, but in, in consideration of the political process, I have to do this in front of everybody. Uh, Chair Roman, I wanted to uh, commend you on receiving the uh, Laverne Norris Gaynor Environmental Champion Award this past uh, month at the Friends of Rookery Bay Annual Gala. Uh, I've had the privilege of, of knowing Mrs. Gaynor for many years, and it is truly a prestigious award. And, and I, I can't think of anybody who's more deserving of everything that you do for the environment between the base and then the district and who knows how many other organizations, including your many years of volunteering, uh, countless hours at Rookery Bay. Just wanted to, uh, to publicly recognize you since it's inappropriate to do so personally of, of this uh, uh, award. And I can't think of anybody else who's more deserving of, of, all, of what you've done. And I think I speak for my fellow board members as well. So congratulations in receiving this award. And I just wanted to, uh, from my alma mater, send out a, an applause to you and recognize you on this uh, accomplishment. Well, thank, thank you so much, Andy. That, that means a lot. And the fact that you knew that the award, uh, who it was named for, and how much she did for our community here in Collier County, that, that makes that uh, awfully special. And, and certainly the award was incredible. And I'm still, I'm still kind of savoring the moment, if, if you will, because it was such, a, such an honor for my years of 
dedication to protecting the environment and my volunteer service. So thank you for recognizing that, Andy, and, and uh, passing that along. And I appreciate everyone's uh, support on that. And happy anniversary, Andy. Thank you. Congratulations again. And I look forward to seeing everybody in person next, uh, next board meeting. Thank you so much. Is there any other board comment? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Andy. And we're going to move on. Uh, yeah, unless we need a short break, are we good? Let's take a five minute break. Give uh, Aaron and Rosie and the staff that's here and has got a long drive home.
Madam Chair, you have a live mic. Okay, let's get back uh, to our, our meeting with and begin with our technical reports. And Andrew Wolf's here with our field station activity report. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just want to run through what the field station's been doing since the last uh, basin board meeting. Uh, we'll be looking at the maintenance activities, then three months look ahead in the remedy tracking system. Um, this time of year, it's a challenge to keep the canals clear of vegetation due to the low water and the high temperatures. So we had a contractor in Henderson Creek with the truck sore, which this boat is actually what we're gonna be buying next year. So it's a good chance to see it work in action. Um, our structure maintenance has been putting in uh, gates at some of our uh, canal access points which uh, is a good safety, safety item. Uh, we, these, a lot of these are at the end of roads, so we, uh, this will keep public uh, from hopefully driving in the canal. <laughs> um, we did a large project on Faka Union uh, erosion project, which was spoken about earlier at the public comment. I have a few pictures of the process. If you see on the left, the, how the bank is falling in uh, with the sandy bank, on the right is our right-of-way marker, which is about ready to go into the water. So we have no right-of-way there at all. So we uh, put in two culverts to get access to the property and we had to build a road on the property to get the trucks in with the, the material. We uh, put down fill to level the bank out. And then on the right is uh, Mako and uh, Dre, uh, putting out uh, filter fabric that goes over the fill. The filter fabric will keep the sand from washing out from underneath uh, at the bank and hopefully hold everything in place. Uh, then we put 57 rock on top of the filter fabric and slope the bank to uh, the angle we needed. And then we put in six to 12 inch riprap um, on the right there with the long arm trico. And this is uh, what the bank looks like uh, when we're done, but I don't have the final pictures yet because we still have to sod the area and uh, put the fence back in, which I'll have some final pictures on our uh, next basin board meeting. So our three month look ahead, basically this time of year uh, for canal maintenance is just getting ready, everything ready for the wet season and the high water. And structure maintenance, it's a lot of PMs and just making sure the structures are in tip top shape for our wet season. And then any AVOs that come through this time of year. Um, our remedy tracking system, it was uh, actually pretty quiet two months. We had one bank erosion issue, which that's what we were taking care of at Faka Union, and one debris in the canal complaint, and only two cars in the canal for the past two months, which is down from our usual. <laughs> Less and then our pump station, uh, our SERP. Um, again, this is the time of year we do preventive maintenance and make sure the pump stations are ready for the high water and the wet season. Um, at Merritt, we're, we've uh, totally disassembled one pump and we're replacing the pump shaft there, which took about two weeks to pull out. And we discovered there was some damage to the diffuser in the pump. So that's now up at a metal shop in uh, Tampa getting repaired. We should have it back by the 1st of June and hopefully be operational within two weeks uh, after that. But all the other pumps are, are ready to go. So we're, we're set fine for a wet season. Um, a three month look ahead is just respond to AVOs, uh, preventive maintenance, ensuring that everything's ready for wet season, and then finishing uh, installing the pump at uh, Merritt or the pump shaft and assembling the pump at Merritt. We're also going to clear the vegetation at the Faka Union Spreader Basin, which will help the flow on the discharge side of the pump station. And other than that, any questions? Are there board questions for Mr. Wolf? No, for me. I, I don't have any questions, but I would like to comment on the great work that you did out there on that Faka Canal. I mean, you saw that the residents came today. Uh, that's the ut utmost praise that you can you can have for the work you're doing and not only serving the mission of the district, but you and your field station folks actually serving members of the public as well. And the team's very proud of that. That turned out very well. Yep. And and it was you that part, worked very, very well with Lisa Keeler and the basin staff and coming up with solutions and alternatives. So 
uh, uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, it's terrific. Thank you. There you go. Um, Aaron, do we have any public comment on this? I have no public comment. Okay, on great. Water conditions report, Mr. Brad Jackson. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, board members. My name is Brad Jackson, Basin Engineer. I'm here to present our water conditions report since our last board meeting in February. I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, here we've got our year-to-date summary. It's our rainfall total for 2022. The takeaway here is it's been dry. That was pretty well advertised since October. Uh, with the La Nina conditions we've had, we're running about 60% of normal for the year so far. So to go through this uh, month by month, here's our March totals. Um, like I mentioned, it was below average. All of our subbasins were ended up below average. We didn't really have any that stuck out as anything above average. All of them were below. We're, there were a couple areas over here by um, Northern Fakahatchee that did get some beneficial rainfall, but overall it was very dry. Uh, fast forward to April. Uh, so far we're below average. We may not end the month that way. Uh, there's some change in the forecast coming up. I'll mention that at the end. Uh, but here, basically, the takeaway is we had a very wet area, uh, a stalled thunderstorm that ended up on their Picayune and Fakahatchee down here towards the southern part of the system. It was all natural areas that got about five inches of rain in one evening. So a couple hours, and that's how much rain we got. That's even an ordinary for wet season. Uh, so it's unusual. It hasn't happened in quite some time, according to our district meteorologist. So I thought it was important to, to highlight that briefly. And then looking at our water year, this is our last month of the um, 2022 water year. Just some key notes here. Um, overall for the year, it's pretty much average, maybe slightly below. Our wet season was above average slightly, um, but the main takeaway here is the uh, surplus we had during the wet season is pretty much all used up. And then some with our dry season, we've had five months of significantly below average rainfall, 50% of average since December, and really even November was below average as well. That 3.8 inches fell in the first couple of weeks. So it's been quite some time since we've had measurable rainfall um, and with a four or four and a half inch deficit so far. So with half of the amount of water that we should have for this time of year, how is our water level doing in our canal systems? Overall, we're doing better than you would think, considering we've had half the amount of rainfall. Um, our levels are near average for the most part. Um, the takeaway here on the, the right-hand side, you see a lot of blacks and blues and picking in Strand, State Road 29. Those are the areas that receive the heavy rainfall. So those are above average for this time of year. The heart of the system, Golden Gate, Maine, Coquihatchee, all pretty much near average conditions for um, late April. We do have a couple outliers here, GG1, Airport Road, you probably noticed that driving around town. Those levels are lower than normal, um, but they've pretty much stopped receding at this point. I don't expect them to get any lower. Looking north to our um, crew, our corkscrew regional system, levels there are pretty much in the normal range, even though we've had um, lower rainfall, um, some beneficial rainfall did fall in the upper end of Golden Gate, Maine, which helped part of that. but. Overall, we're in the normal range here in crew. I do want to highlight briefly this KEA 846. That was offline um, for quite some time. This is the new USGS monitoring well that Lucene talked about. So it's online and reporting, and this acts as an indicator for our Picayune project. So it's been so dry. Um, we do have drought conditions. It's no surprise. Uh, there's been a burn ban in Collier County. Um, so you know, the drought monitor is indicating that the very western part of the basin and the west coast here has severe, severe drought conditions, and that lessens as you get towards the east. Um, fortunately, we're at the very end of dry season, and um, the one here on the right, just focus here on Florida, this kind of beige color or greenish color that indicating the drought won't stick around much longer as we move into dry season. So that's fairly typical for this time of year. So I wanted to take just a minute. This is something a little different than I haven't highlighted before, but I wanted to highlight one of our capital projects that is important this time of year for dry season. So this is a comparison of our curry structure that was 
um, what the conditions look like before it was built, what the conditions look like after. And I want you to remember both of these comparisons, we had similar rainfall conditions. So we had below average rainfall. So to orient everyone, we're up here on the north side of the basin near um, uh, our corkscrew canal, near our bird rookery area. This is uh, the structure is just south of Mockley Road. So here's some pictures. This is pre-construction. Uh, right here where I'm circling, is that's where the new structure will be built um, or was built, but this was beforehand. It's interesting, the canal is completely bone dry. Um, and we had similar rainfall conditions as we do this year. We want to make sure we were comparing apples to apples, and looking at two dry years. Um, then we want to move north a little bit here to Corkscrew. This is Corkscrew Canal. You've got deer in the, in the canal bottom there. Um, there. It's completely bone dry. And that's up here at our very headwater area, just south of Bird Rookery in the Crew and Corkscrew Swamp area that we're trying to make sure we don't have any impacts on. So that's before our structure. Now fast forward after we've built it, reorient you here, the curry structure again. This is close to the same vantage point. It's a little tricky to get the same shot from the helicopter, but it's close. Um, so we've got a Mockley Road. Here is the new curry structure. And the takeaway here, you can see water inside the canal. Um, and remember the water is not just in the canal, it's actually the surficial groundwater level. So it expands everywhere throughout the region, not just inside the canal. So we also flew up towards the north a little bit, Corkscrew Canal. Um, this is up here where I've circled the um, kind of yellowish area by Cork 3 near Bird Rookery where the trail area are. Um, you've got water in the canal there. So it's a vast contrast from the, the deer sitting in the bottom of the canal. Um, to give that a little bit more context, I mentioned that it's spread out everywhere. Um, just to orient you here quickly, the curry structure here is where the arrow is pointing down here and this kind of blue area um, and then the red bullseye, that's the area of benefit where we see increased groundwater levels from our model. So this was before we built anything. This is what our models told us would happen. We've seen the results of it in the field after we built it. So it's validating what we saw in the model. And this is really how much benefit we've seen from that. Uh, that structure. And this is just one example of one capital project. And um, this structure has remote operability. It lets us really uh, refine that water level to, to such a tight range. That is so exciting. I, I just have to jump in. That is just so terrific. And the way that you've presented that to the board, Brad, is just off the charts good. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, so that kind of closes that little part of it. I'll run through. These are our typical slides. We'll stair step through the system here quickly. These are the tr historical trends for each of the areas. This is Golden Gate 4 on the top, Golden Gate 1 on the bottom. Um, the green band is our normal range, and you can see GG1 down here is very low for this time of year. But as we're approaching wet season, we want to be in this blue band as we hit wet season. So we're not too far off from where we want to be. These won't be low for, for very long. Moving north here, Coco, uh, Cocahatchee Canal, we've got Cocoa 1 and 2. These are in good shape as well, near the average conditions uh, for both of these. Depending on when wet season hits, we'll see this line start to reverse and then come towards here, toward the normal operational range. And this blue band here is the same band that Akeen had shown on his slides earlier as well. Moving east towards FACA Union, um, towards, the set, towards the bottom here, this is FACA Union 1. It was running along the lower levels. And then I mentioned that large rainfall event just spiked up the uh, um, water table there, two to two and a half feet in overnight is how quickly that rose up. Um, not just here at FACU Union, but all of the groundwater and picking and strand as well. Um, FACU Union 5, you're seeing a trend down towards the 50th percentile, but we're in good uh, track to reach the wet season operational level by uh, mid-May. Flip over to Henderson Creek. There's not a whole lot to say here other than we're in good, good shape and in normal conditions. And we'll see those levels start to rebound after the, the rainy season begins. Moving up to uh, Picayune Strand, I'll spend a second here. Um, so the, you can see the rainfall event. These are these two spikes um, in both of these lines here, the purple line and then the blue line over here. That's that four to five inch rainfall that we had, it fell more on FACA Union, but it jumped it up to where 
we've never seen levels before this time of year. That's due to the canal being plugged. Um, it's holding that water inside the system, inside, the, inside your groundwater and on the surface. Um, and then just to compare and contrast um, the bottom pictures here, this is the FAC Union restoration flows from August. Um, the helicopter flight there, you can see the sheet flow happening. Uh, we just did our pre-hurricane pre -hurricane inspections uh, a week or so ago. This is what it looked like um, a couple weeks ago. So while there's no sheet flow, there's still water in these pools, and these pools are full, indicating the groundwater is higher than it's historically been. So it's a good takeaway there. Um, it is dry season. It's water conservation month, and so we wanted to, to brief, talk briefly about water level I'm sorry, groundwater level conditions. Um, overall for Collier County, um, as you saw earlier, most of our wells and our uh, potable water supply comes from the Tamiami and surf surface water. So our levels here are pretty much in the green. And you can see that here on the right, um, these green squares indicate that the water levels are normal for this time of year. There's a couple outliers here, um, over here near Coco One, near uh, Cocahatchee Outfall. Um, it's trending near the bottom of the level there. Um, it's not necessarily unusual to see it that low, and we're nowhere near the higher concern for the, uh, the kind of red line. It's never approached that before. So do expect this responds very quickly to rainfall, and these levels will start to increase soon. Um, it's, so overall, at this time of dry season, we're looking in good shape. So to talk briefly about long-range outlook. Um, so like La, we had La Nina around for dry season. It'll probably continue to be around, but weakening through um, spring and summer. And what that means is this area of the Pacific is cooler than normal. And the blue line here on the bottom left indicates the probability we'll have a La Nina event. And why that's important for us is for hurricane development, it has a, um, the wind shear that is present in the Atlantic area is less intense. So it's more favorable for more hurricanes to form. It's probably why we've seen some of the forecasts saying we'll probably have an above average year again for hurricane activity. Um, that's one side of it. Then the day-to-day -day sea breeze thunderstorms that we see, there's not really an indicator one way or the other if we're gonna be wetter than normal or drier. So really nothing, nothing to take away there that we'll just, we'll have to see what happens and um, we're ready for whatever mother nature sends our way. In the short term, I promise the change in forecast. I know we all need some rainfall. Uh, Definitely. So there's a front moving through. This isn't wet season yet. It's a frontal system that's coming through, but we are going to have a wet period over the next week, which is um, direly needed, uh, especially in the coastal areas for us. And I'll close there and ask if there's any questions. Are there any board questions for Brad? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just to, to echo what you said a moment ago, I Thank you for the the pictures of the uh, Curry Canal and, and showing the difference. It, um, you know, we know these things work, but it is valuable to actually see it in action and see the result of it. So, thank you. And, and I thought the way that was presented was great. Thanks. And Brad definitely took on that challenge from our last meeting. Uh, yes. And really, you did an outstanding job. And the 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 deer were a little bit extra, which which that was, was a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, it was a bonus. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let you know that I was out with the Corps of Engineers out at Picayune Strand, and I was looking at the construction of the Southwest Protection Levy, and then I also met with the Corps' heavy equipment team that is finishing plugging the FACA Union Canal. And um, since our last meeting, they have finished the 3.3 miles, so we're going to get an additional hydrological benefit this, this rainy season for that. And their, their job or their guidance and direction is to keep going with preparing to plug uh, when, it be, when the southern end of the Southwest Protection Levy uh, comes up enough in height where we can actually turn that pump on, on full force. So, so I'm still working with the Corps of Engineers on that, but we should see a, a greater benefit this rainy season now that more of that canal is plugged. So um, I, I'm excited about that. And I appreciate the effort that you put in the briefing today, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that brings us to the Basin Administrator's Report with Lisa Keeler. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep this short. 
uh, with the time. We've had a very technically dense meeting today uh, and appreciate all of your participation in, in this. Um, on the agenda, I had indicated that I was gonna be talking about the agreement uh, with Collier County regarding our tower, but I'd like to push that off to the next meeting. Um, I haven't pushed that particular uh, task forward and I don't have the update that I was anticipating having for you today. So I'll have something for you uh, more concrete in July. But before we do go forward to Candy's report, um, a couple of things I want to touch on. And it, again, to talk about the FACA Union Canal um, and the Radners coming and, and, and showing their appreciation. Um, Andrew's team was phenomenal, but it also I want to um, pass along kudos and thanks to Brad and Lucene. Um, so yeah, the, the Radners had come and talked to me and all I did is walk back to Brad's office afterwards and said, hey, what do you think? <laughs> and he really took the ball and worked with Lucene and there was people on Lucene's team that was involved. Th this was a huge effort by a lot of folks um, and we're just happy that we could make that happen for them. Um, also, as we've been talking about, we're in dry season. Um, Andrew talked about all the preparation, getting ready for wet season, and just wanted to remind you that we all went through our annual Hurricane Freddy exercise last week as we were preparing for board meeting. Um, so I feel like we're all in really good shape to address the needs of this community as they, as they rise this season. And with that, that's all I have, unless you have any questions. Are there any questions for Lisa? Thank you, Lisa, and I appreciate you pointing out the fact that Brad and Lucene were instrumental in that, that effort as well. It, it takes almost a whole village to get anything done and, and there's a lot of folks that contribute. So thank you. Um, the, um, I just thought of something because of Brad's uh, technical report. He had mentioned that USGS monitoring well at Crom Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. And I know that the board is looking forward to an update on the next steps with the corkscrew swamp sanctuary uh, hydrology. Yes. Is, it, that's, is that in the future? I think we have it planned for your October meeting. Oh, super. Okay, that was the next steps that you're gonna give, present yeah, it's, to us. It's coming up in the next few meetings. Okay, that'll be fine. Uh, I figured it was on the list. I just wanted to make sure because that just jogged my memory. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we've got Candy Heater for our monthly financial report. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. The monthly financial report um, that you have in your packages is through the month of February. Um, I'd like to say that you all have collected 93% of your revenues. Um, you've collected $10.6 million dollars. Uh, out of $11.4 million, you know, new revenue budget, um, 10.5 of that is from Avalorum taxes. You're at 93.4%, which is almost on trend. It's about 0.5% under trend. So that's nothing to be alarmed of. Um, your uh, permitting fees, there's uh, about a $13,000 um, uh increased revenue collection because of right-of-way permits. So that's positive extra money coming in for you. Um, on the expenditure side, Lucene uh, mentioned, you know, that that on the expenditures, the capital program is really doing very well because of the multi-year projects and, and the projects being on schedule, the one project, et cetera. So um, you all look very, very good financially and um, I foresee no issues so, and staff doesn't. Are there any questions for Candy from the board? Thank you, Candy, for being here today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all the work that you do for the basin. Thank you. Thank you. And your all your staff that does. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, that brings us to the second general public comment period. It's another chance for members of the public to comment on things that weren't on the agenda. Do we have any public comment, Erin? I have no public comment, Madam Chair. Okay. All right, final board comment. Any board members have anything? All right, I have a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank all of the board members uh, for the work that you are doing on the Basin Board. We had a full agenda today. I know that um, you're wrapping your head around a lot of technical topics and the effort that you're putting in and 
the focus and the dedication needs to be recognized. And so I, I, I wanna say thank you for that because it, it doesn't happen by, as we just discussed, by one person alone. So, so thank you for all of your effort and uh, contributions to the discussion today. Also, I wanna thank the district staff. I mean, talk about a support team. It's incredible to have, for example, Rosie here, who runs everything to do with the governing board here helping with the basin in order to take over for the next couple of months while we have a leave of absence. And we're gonna miss Erin, uh, but uh, we'll be thinking about her. And we had to save this long meeting for her today, uh, but hopefully uh, she got through it just okay, uh, got through it just fine. And uh, so Rosie, thank you for being here because you're juggling a lot of balls and, and uh, we appreciate the support and the dedication that you, you provide to the Basin Board. So thank you for that. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, thank all of the members of the district staff from headquarters that were here today. The room was full and many of the presentations were from, from folks that are, are leading efforts such as Akeen with this, pumping to the Collier County through the Logan um, spillway there. And, and so all of you deserve a big thank you for the outstanding support that you're providing uh, to the Basin Board. And Candy, you, you deserve a special shout out because Candy runs all of the finances for the entire district. And I gave her a pass today to participate by Zoom. And she decided that she wanted to be here anyway. And she came here and she's probably regretting it now. But um, really in truthfulness, Candy, you and you and your team do such a tremendous job. And I think it's, it's Julie that's, that's here uh, with you today. And thank you for everything that you contribute and the IT staff and everybody. So it goes without saying that the district staff is a key part of the basin uh, being able to do what it does. And finally, I'd like to thank the Basin staff. I mean, they're, they're normally at seven, right? And they've got four and now probably three for a while. So, I mean, this is, this is just great stuff. And you are so technically and professional, uh, professionally capable that you're, you can juggle all the balls. And under your leadership, Lisa, it's, it's been working so smoothly and everything. And I, I wanna thank you for all the tremendous support that, that you've provided. And the fact that Derek has been quiet means that we've been doing our jobs well. So, so thank you, Derek, he, he's our attorney and I, I appreciate that. So with that, I wanna thank everyone for being here today. Our next meeting is going to be July 8th at 1.30, and with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.